should have a preview. Yeah, because we don't need to have documents, right? You're right. So we can just leave this. You're right. There we go. Hello. Yes. Are we? We're live, huh? Yeah, yeah I think we're streaming just to Tim. Hi, Tim. Hi, Tim. Yeah. Let's see here. Go ahead. Talk about, go on show witness. Talk about delays, though. Do you do you see like how mm -hmm. late the delay is? is it's that even the way worse it than normal. Is? For me, it's usually a pretty long delay. Uh, it's like and you can seconds you can try like, to scoot in a little bit more. It's just these try. chairs are, I think, extra wide. These in chairs my are substantial. Yeah, I'm not that wide in yeah. general, so don't yeah. need quite as much. But uh, but yeah, no. We it looks like we are just streaming to Tim. So Tim. This, this is, yeah, yeah this, this is your special moment. This, this is really about you. This is a special train stream just for you. And it's your time to shine exactly. as a commenter. And we're going to just talk about things that you care about while we um, adjust ourselves uh, because we're going to be looking at ourselves the entire time and thinking primarily of ourselves and how we look. Yeah, which is also the most important thing. Let's be honest. Yeah. So in other words, the uh, it'll be pretty much the same for me, but the, exactly. the two this of you, it'll be a little I mean, bit for different. For me, this is every day anyway, right? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Nothing really different. Yeah, but we now we do have um, we do have this over here. Uh, you can't see it, but we have a great big notepad, and I feel like we should use it. You at some you point. say we as if this is our room to use their supplies at our will. It should is. we first maybe I am, however, introduce where we are and super ready we to yeah, steal all of right. the post-it notes. Yeah. I am That's I am ready. A lot of notes. By the and way, Tim has left. He's, he's, he's like, like screwed. I'm, yeah. I'm absolutely done. Uh, but so, Ooh, no. Oh my. I was trying to there. It says we have two viewers. Oh that those those things are never they're not Real yeah. time. That's uh, also don't worry about that. That's that's not important. It's very important. Yeah. It's very important. And one of the viewers is always going to be us. Yeah. So this you is always like, have one viewer. That's right. Yeah. This is like, this is real when it comes I to. I was just saying it. Thanks. Let's our, Tim is our still YouTube here. fame. Let's let's make this professional. We have to say where we are, what we're doing here. It's true. Thank you. What is the point? Thank you, Matthias. Yes. So uh, welcome to Nijmegen where we are at the moment. Nijmegen is a city in the Netherlands, which is a country I've heard of. Mm -hmm. um, it is not that. actually a ring of hell, uh, which is what the country sounds like. Netherlands, yeah. The netherworld, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it really depends. It will probably be a ring of hell pretty soon. I don't know the way things are going. So. Yeah. Bubba is here. Oh, hello. Oh. Like probably saying Dutch. Hello. Okay. <laughs> I don't know, that looks a little more like French to me, but yeah. Uh. You know, there's this um, there's this thing that they do. It's it's kind of cute, but uh, there's a New Orleans uh, football team called the Saints, and mm -hmm. they have um, these signs that they um, that they put up uh, because you know there's a lot of French influence of course, in, in yeah. New Orleans that say "Go Saints," but the "Go" is spelled. G E A U X. Oh, right. Yeah, like go. Yeah. And, and it's very cute, but of course, if it were actually pronounced in French, that would be Jo. Um, jo, yeah. Which I don't think that they understand. And so it's both clever and stupid at the same time. Um, it's a little bit the equivalent of like writing things in fake Cyrillic, right? It's like. It, it is, but it's like but they could have just. They could have just removed the E and they would have been fine, you know? Um, yeah, go would have worked. Yeah, 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 that's true. Or they could have gone even further and put a U in front of the E. Yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah like, like like as in go. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think it would have just been better to do G A U X. That would have been much a shorter. Yeah, route. I recommend you get in touch with their marketing people and sort this out. Yeah. I think, that's, I, I think that's the dumb thing. I, I think it's really just because we're only familiar with the bow situation, and yeah. therefore go should be spelled the same way. Yeah. They don't, you know, not that they actually know French. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. But anyway, we are in so, Nijmegen. Yes. Why are we in Nijmegen? We are in Nijmegen for the In Science Film Festival, which is uh, a, a really cool film festival that is both like a an actual like film festival with awards and things like that but also uh, the, an invitation, kind of an open invitation to scientists with interest in film to come and uh, have, you know, a, a meeting of the minds, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And we were brought here to present, thanks to... To be to, part of the minds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, uh, thanks, to, you know, I never got her last name, but thanks Sarah. to Sarah. Mm -hmm. Go yeah. Sarah. Sarah is the reason you. that we're here. <laughs> Go Sarah. Sarah. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, what have we just done yesterday? We screened what? Dune 2. <laughs> exactly. Oh God, we yeah. did that. <laughs> Dave has already Save. forgotten me because yeah. you know, you know, this was a minor you know, detail in his life. So this is like almost, <laughs> almost irrelevant. But, well, but for many people, Dune 2 has been quite an important movie release. And uh, you both worked on it. And yeah, that's we right. We just had a screening about it yesterday. That was nice. That was nice. That was I got nice. to see it. I was planning to see it anyway. But this was an even better occasion to do so. Yeah, actually, this was going to be... Um, more momentous for us. This was going to be when we saw the film, because at the time that we were talking about this, uh, that was when Dune was going to be released. Oh, so it got released earlier than yes. expected. Okay. Yeah, and then it was like, eh, okay, and then we went to see it. Uh, truly, to no fanfare, because like again, this is a very bizarre uh, phenomenon just with cinemas today. But you know, of course, Dune Two is very successful. You know, it's mm -hmm. setting box office records and all that. People are going to see the movie. But we went and saw it the very first Saturday, opening weekend in the United States um, at 9 p.m., which is a, a very popular time to see movies, mm -hmm. 9 p.m. on a Saturday. We were the only people in the theater. For real? Yeah. yeah. We, I have a stop There were other people behind us. Oh, how many? Well, I mean, I would say like six, but like we were not okay. the actual only people. Yeah, I am it was very, because very like, empty. Yeah, because like Dune One was also a huge success, and everybody know more or less who watches movies, which well, is generally not me, but in it, this case, even I saw it, and everybody else saw it. Yeah, I would expect really, Dune Two to do really well. It says less about the movie and more about the movie theater that when we walked yeah. in on this Saturday evening. One, it was empty to the point where I was like, are they even open? Are they showing movies right now? Empty in the entire theater. Mm -hmm. And they no longer, like, they're in this wave of buy your tickets online, but, like, no one at the theater is checking to see if you have tickets. <laughs> yeah. So, like, there's nowhere to go. There's just a concession counter, but, like, no one stops you if you just walk back you to the theater. You just wander in, okay. Uh -huh. And so, like, I think it's really just that this particular theater is so on the verge of dying that they can't even care if they you steal your way in to see movies. They don't actually care anymore. And they have just given up. Yeah. yeah. And okay. so, like, I think that theater will probably be closed in the next two years, if not two I'm weeks. I'm hearing that a lot of cinemas in general are closing, right? I mean, the competition yeah. with streaming and DVD and all that stuff. It is. Like Blu -ray and I, mm. Between that and the shift that I think a lot of people went through with um, COVID, where it was just like, you didn't go to the yeah, movies. Yeah, you can do it anyway. And then suddenly it was like, wait, these movies are starting to be released earlier. Some of them, same time, right? Like some movies are being released streaming and theater at the same time. Um, and it's like, if you pay slightly more to buy the movie even when it's like first released on streaming and it's not yet free streaming if you're splitting that between two or three people suddenly it's way cheaper to yeah. sit at home and eat your own food well, that's pause thing, it for right? bathroom everybody breaks. likes that comfy kind of aspect of it yeah. and it's and like the whole cinema experience is sort of just not that highly yeah. rated anymore in yeah. comparison so it's uh, definitely, and of course, people just have more other things to do. There's just a lot of other entertainment out there with gaming and streaming and whatever. Yeah. That yeah. There's a lot of competition from people just watching YouTube all day and whatever. Yeah. I, I have a free idea that I'm going to give to movie theaters because I think this could potentially be popular. For, um, for television shows that are bigger and kind of more of an event, I think they should offer discounted movie ticket prices. Uh, so that you can go watch the live airing of the, you know, a particular episode of a television show in the theater because it might be fun. I have the big I'm audience. Seeing, uh, I know, for example, there is the uh, very, by now a very popular um, D and D tabletop live series, Critical Role, which yeah. I've been a fan of for a very long time. Yeah, I'm a real OG Critical Role fan. Um, but they have actually done a number of live screenings as well as also uh, cinematic like releases as it were of their shows nice. which they did in combination with like I, I don't remember what the brand name is but one of those big chains in America of cinemas right. mm -hmm. and they actually did this thing where fans could go locally to their cinema and like watch them do their thing essentially for several hours and those things sold out completely. That's amazing. So there's a lot of interest in that kind of stuff. So I think that's a little bit in the same line as what you're suggesting. So there yeah. definitely are opportunities of that kind that are probably not being utilized at the moment. Yeah. Um, I'm going to just say uh, two things, one to that and then one in general. 
I've noticed that um, I look more attractive on screen when I'm either looking straight ahead or at Mateus, and that I look less attractive when I'm looking at Jesse. So I'm not. But that's going to look that's at relative, you. right? I mean, it's Jesse's beauty, and then not going to look so at you like, as much. It makes sense. It's yeah. So I'm just I'm just letting you know. I'm not I intentionally giving you the cold shoulder, but and I'm yet. probably going to be doing more <laughs> of this this stream. Yet. Good to see you. Now, uh, but this actually, is what happens when there's two men and one woman, one woman in a room. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, she gets the compliments. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I, I was going to mention this. So this was a phenomenon, and if you're not in the United States and older, you wouldn't know about this. But there was this television show called Miami Vice, and it was a ridiculous show. In fact, when uh, when they were first showing screeners, like Nekiward executives, they were like, "This is the dumbest thing that we have ever seen." They're like, this is like a two hour long music video. Why would anybody watch this? So that must be really successful. Yeah, yeah. so of course. It, it was uh, starring, you know, it was basically, it was a cop show taking place in Miami. And there were these two, you know, young, attractive male cops went around solving crimes, you know, specifically usually drug related crimes in Miami. And they were just like dressed, you know, great, you know, wearing these really sharp like 80s suits with like a tank top underneath. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They were always just like kind of like, you know, sweaty and chic looking, driving really hot cars. Um, and there was like really top tier, like popular music from the era, like playing in the background. I mean, they um, remade it. That's how popular yeah, it was. Barely any plot to these things. It'd be like, this is the, the villain of the week, and it's mostly just how can we get these guys looking sexy and, you know, talking to hot women. Um, and so the network executives um, believed in this show so little that the time slot that they offered them for new shows was Friday, which was the worst, considered to be the worst day of the week for television, because people weren't going, staying inside to watch television, they were going out. Friday at 10 p.m. This is when new is episodes bad. aired. Friday at 10 p.m. So there were, it, it's kind of like the kiss of death. Here's, here's a little, there you little go. aesthetic. Right. Okay, Let's yeah. see. Don Hold Johnson. that up. A little aesthetic for you. Crockett and Tubbs. The, Waiting uh, to see if it's actually on screen. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, it's, it's, a, little, it's a little, a little, a little so I'm going to move it back and forth a little bit. So hopefully everyone. People can pause later. Yeah. Right? This is. Anyway, so, uh, so yeah, that, that was basically their way of saying, like, okay, obviously we made a mistake in giving you any money at all, right? But uh, we're going to, and we're not going to, but we're not going to outright cancel you. We're going to say, you know, here you go. Here is your, your, your television slot, 10 p.m. on a Friday. You know, be proud of that. Anyway, so they thought, like, you know, within, like, a few weeks, this show is going to be dead. What ended up happening, this show became such a phenomenon that there uh, arose this situation where bars started advertising, we're gonna air the new episode of Miami Vice on Fridays. And so people would come to bars, like bars loved it, they would just flock to it and they would you know, sell these drinks in preparation. And then when the show would come on, you know, everybody would quiet down, they'd turn up the TV and they'd watch the new episode of Miami Vice. And it became the number one television show for like, three or four years running. It's a bit like they do with, with you know, football competitions and stuff, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But can we point out the, the difference here where now that would be bad for business in some ways because only one TV is airing that show for a whole bunch of viewers. Yeah. You want as many TVs as possible airing the show for numbers to count these days. That's true. And so like, oh, like yeah, with streaming yeah, yeah. where you have streaming parties and a bunch of people watch it under one account, well, they think the show is not doing well mm -hmm. uh, because it doesn't have enough accounts streaming it. Yeah. And so like now that would actually be bad for business, whereas back then yeah. it was a cultural, like everyone's talking about it and that's how they knew it was a hit. Of course, yeah, it was good for the bars, but right. not for streaming services, right. right? I mean, Netflix or whatever wouldn't like a, uh, you know, well, a sell subscription. Netflix is a thing like the, you know, the, the show drops at midnight and then they check at 1 a.m. and they're like, it's people not have, successful. People have barely finished one episode. They haven't even got through the entire season yet. What are we doing? Cancel it immediately. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Why aren't they watching this on eight times speed? Mm. 
<laughs> okay, so now I have a very important question that's yes. not at all related to sure. TV or film. Huh? I'm just now realizing this is all just decorative, yeah? Yeah, like it's not two pieces. To be, this is actually supposed to be sort of like you know laced oh, up like this, but I was a little too la yeah. lazy to actually do it but properly. But I thought it was two pieces too originally, lazy and, and to do it. <laughs> yeah, so but I am actually wearing a thing under this, so this is what oh, you're seeing. Oh, so, so you would normally see it would oh, normally be a peekaboo. Oh, uh, yeah. So this, this can also be with just bare shoulders, but because it's okay. kind of rainy and you know, not super yeah. warm outside, I decided to also wear my hoodie. I'm now it. understanding. I kept staring at it like. What's going so, on? Yeah. Here? Yeah. Okay, oh, so now yeah. So see. this is all Thank stuff God. from like somebody else is saying something. Like we allegedly have people watching. Nobody is talking. Well, it's because no, I it's started like, talking about wardrobe, and then we got more more yeah, people. Yeah, of course. Then that's what Logan is interested. in, Really, it's yeah, like, we yeah. start talking about my clothing. That's We're not here to talk about wardrobe. We're here to talk about word robe. Oh, <laughs> wow, wow. He did it, he did it. Thank you. All right, yeah. So transition us into into something yeah, language-related. Just, just as a reminder, just for anybody watching or anybody who watches this later, um, for, for patrons specifically, the poll isn't ending. It's We're, we're going to resolve the poll next week. Um, so, uh, so vote Matthias, between you, now you and then. You still have time to, um, to you know, to come to, to come ten to, minutes before the yeah, or, or to come to the stream and say that you forgot. Um, it's a very important vote, by the way, hugely important. Like every vote. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it was it was funny. So my mother is a, a patron now, and you know she was saying period. I was like, ah, I never understand what you're talking about in in the polls. I'm like, that's all right, mom. You don't need to do that. And then so I said, like, oh, but I wish you would have voted for this option because, you know, the patrons voted for the one I didn't like. So she, she texted me and said, like, which one do I vote for? And I'm like, uh, I don't know yet. I have to wait to see how the patrons are, are voting for me to figure out why I don't like what they're choosing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, David. See, see, nowadays I always vote for the boring option. Like, you know, whenever we have anything like, oh, we can make it really complicated or we can add a lot of affix or we just don't do anything with it. I'm nowadays always voting for... Don't, don't do anything. Do anything. There you because go. I know also that the patrons will always vote for the most outlandish, contrived construction, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so I feel like for a naturalistic effect, there has to be a bit of a counter There, there has to be at least one thing that's Exactly. Boring. There has to be somebody who votes for, you know, the, whatever the really boring oh, option is. Jason is yeah. here. Oh, hi, Alk. And Alk is here. Yay. Nice. Anyway, oh, uh, Pi Day. I read that as PI Day. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, what's a right. private investigator exactly, day? Yeah, we are oh, being spied upon right now. It's Magnum PI Day. Actually, mm -hmm. I wonder when uh, that that Pi Day is very close to the Magnum PI Murder She Wrote crossover. Oh, my God. Uh, and now I want Why to see. Why do you even know the date of that? Uh, because I looked it up. Uh, the, oh, you know, when, when you're, oh, when you're showing, artifacts they tell you the original. Hello, Artifacts Union. Good to see you. Hey, oh, oh but, of course, but of course, because it's... It's, it's Europe. Yeah. It's not a reasonable hour yeah. for normal people who don't live in the new world or wherever the hell you people are from. Yeah, where are exactly. Europeans? Where is Jake? Uh, okay, hold on. Wait, is Jake right now, though, traveling? Because isn't Jake going to no, be in I, Mumbai? So they were doing the relay, right? So I think they're doing the relay right now. Right and they now, will probably and check in later. Oh, way off. Because I think they're going to be... Yeah, they're going to be in Mumbai later, but I don't think that's traveling. right now. But of course, I don't know their with, schedule. From with, memory, I believe, 90-degree right? weather or something awful. Um, if I did the is, conversion yeah. correctly of... Mm -hmm. I think it was 34 Celsius. Yeah, I mean, is it that, sounds, like sounds plausible, yeah. yeah. Okay. Can you pass me one of those cups of water? I absolutely can. In okay. fact, I will even do so. All right. So now this is going to be mine, and you have you have something in store for you later. And, and yes, Alk, the I love this. Uh, David confessing to you know tampering votes with the help of his mom, and yeah, Bubba's response. He's a nerd. Is absolutely right. That's is that what he was responding to? It is though? now. It is now. Honestly, oh, okay. I think it's a general response to everything that's going on here. It would be reasonably apt, right? I mean, yeah. I thought he was. Uh, I mean, he could. It's actually this is going to be fun. Um, hold on. We're g we're gonna do this right now. We're uh, gonna do a poll. <laughs> Who was Bubba calling a nerd? David, Jason L, Artifexian for saying yo, uh. or or Alk for calling me out. <laughs> Love to see our votes roll in here. Hundred percent, David. I mean, I know what I would be voting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Oh, oh someone went for something spicy. else. It's getting spicy. And then, of course, we'll never know what Bubba's vote is. Look at that. Dancing. It just keeps going to 80, 67. Dancing, oh. dancing. Yeah, it does this thing uh, where oh it goes gosh. back and forth, right? It's like, there's some weird. I think it's while it's doing math in its head. Yeah, there's some kind of weird yeah. thing about live updating. I don't know what's mm. going on with it. Mm. <laughs> Ranger on <laughs> Gate yes, 2024. Exactly. All right, hold on. Let's make sure we get. I mean, the thing is, we know that David and Jesse are Ow. perfectly happy to just ignore poll results anyway, right? When it suits them. So it's not like they need to go out of their way to yeah. defraud the oh whole God. thing. I just assumed that when we, you know, would do votes like this, that. Uh, I don't know that you know patrons would read through the options, carefully consider them, and then you know vote for the most reasonable no, one. No, I think That's I think what in elections. Yeah, I think what David is saying is he just assumed that more people in the world thought exactly like him mm -hmm. than actually do, and this is mm -hmm. something that is consistently something where I have to remind him I don't have your brain. So this is even for me. There are times I have to remind him I am not inside your head. And David is still surprised. I mean, Not I surprised, know. disappointed. <laughs> the question is also like, is it a good or a bad thing if you were all in your head? I mean, would you really want that? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you want a world of Davids? Yeah, it's like a lot of people are like, I kind of like that there's not a lot of me around. You know, it's mm -hmm. one, one is a lot already, so. Mm. All right. And, and Bubba is saying the answer is redacted, so I don't think we'll ever know. However, the majority of our viewers agree that David was the target. Yeah. I mean, That's there's sad. a universal rule of streaming that if you can't exalt the streamer, you will do so. so <laughs> I would have expected this outcome, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, by the way, if you ever want clarifications on any of the poll items or understanding the stakes, you know, I, I'm happy to do that. I always write these things with the understanding that, you know, these are, these are conlangers reading this. And so mm -hmm. I'm not trying to make things simple. I was just like, this is, I'm writing this as if it's to a conlang crowd. That's not necessarily uh, uh, the best thing, but also, you know, we're busy. <laughs> it's, yeah, it is very time consuming to actually write up all the options. Um, mm. Yeah, and I mean, it makes sense also because yeah. like, it's in the context of this ongoing stream, right? Mm -hmm. So like, mm -hmm. and it's also for patrons, so it's people are already committed to the bit as it were mm -hmm. anyway. So you would expect that they are following along, and so you don't need to like spell everything out. Right, yeah. and it's it's really hard to, um, because I mean, there have been times where I look at it and I'm like, oh gosh, wait, what what is this pull on? So it's like, you know, it can be very difficult to understand nuances sometimes. Um, and so, but I think the time consuming part is really, for every option you try to lay out, here's the results so you can compare them. And mm. let me tell you, that is, incredibly time consuming. It's also incredibly mind bendy because when you're trying to go down path A, B, and C all at once without making mistakes, which doesn't always happen, but like when you're trying to do that and lay it all out where it's like similar but different, um, it could be really, really difficult. And so, yeah, by the time you get done with actually laying out the results, it's like description, here you go. <laughs> and, and of course, this is something that you know quite acutely, where <laughs> having created the Conlang venture. Oh, that was very mind bendy. Where it's not like, I'm going to lay out some results and decide which one I like the best. You are doing all of them. <laughs> this is a very, very good exercise for yeah. Conlanging, right? It's like really think about what are all the implications of these decisions? How mm -hmm. far down the rabbit hole can you go with it? Mm -hmm. How does it restructure the whole thing? Yeah, as an exercise, probably even for your own colleagues, it's not a bad thing to do, I would guess. Yeah, and it's going to be really fun when we eventually get to the uh, Fox language, since that is going to be our very first. Uh, what so do you call that? Sister, off. sister language. Yeah, right? sister language. Like, yeah, yeah. I was quite excited about that. I actually wanted to start with that one, but hey. that that will be fun. Hey, Danielle. It's Danielle. It must be. It's is it like early enough, like on the East Coast, that people are awake? Yes. I reckon just about. Bob right? is in Central, and, and yeah. Bob is here. So it's 6.27 in L.A., which is an unreasonable time to be wait, awake. Wait, no, wait, not Central. I'm sorry, Bob. No, Bob is in Virginia. No, you're yeah. in Virginia. Yeah. I momentarily yeah. put you Nine, somewhere else. 9.27 on the East Coast. So that's, that's not bad. That's not bad. 
Yeah, um, I agree, Jason. That was what I was thinking is we would go to the foxes and you would have a very nice comparison of like how you do the sort of two branches of the same language next to each other. Yeah. I think that would have been quite nice in terms it, of the flow. But now I, we get to save up doing this particular kind of branching that for is, later and we build up to doing a different kind of calling. That also makes some sense. Very true. My concern, though, is like, wow, I would have remembered so much more if we had done it back to back. Yeah, that also. And now with the, the break in between, I'm be like, what are we doing now? <laughs> that, no, I think that's going to work to our advantage. Now, I understand what Jason is saying, um, that, you know, it's it was a little bit of a disappointment not going straight from dogs to foxes so that we're right in it. But I think it's going to be a benefit because we're going to forget a little bit. So now we can okay. go back and just re-examine Fair. and not be over-influenced. That's true. We were that now true. constrained by past decisions, and it means yeah. that you can actually show off better how you can make quite substantial variations can, within the same family, right? Can I say, too, though, that sometimes taking a long break on working on a, a language, especially when you're at the point where, like, your grammar is, is you know, pretty much what you need it to be for, for handling most things, and then you, you know, need more vocabulary later on down the line, if there's a, a big break at some point, I feel like that puts in a bit more naturalism with how languages in general develop because the words weren't all created in one go mm. and like compounds were created at different times. And so the fact that you end up kind of doing something a little different or you're in a different sort of aesthetic place, like when you're mm. creating certain chunks of the language, I think it's really nice. Like, I feel like you end up kind of getting a little bit more of that ebb and flow of, well, these were all obviously around the same time frame historically, and then these were all because I took a six-month break. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. And you, you get a bit more distancing in that way, and especially with, like, I don't know about how it is with you guys, but I sometimes get very sort of focused on using particular bits of the phonology yeah, too much, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. Or you got really like into a particular construction that you're sort of obsessed with or things mm-hmm. like that. It's actually good then to have a break and to right. sort of zoom out like, oh, how did this whole thing hang together again? And suddenly things occur to you that you just weren't really seeing. Right, you know, right. You know, the forest for the trees kind yeah, of yeah. problem. <laughs> that can be quite useful because I have like a bunch of these languages in parallel. I sort of go back and forth between them and I get this quite a bit. It actually works out rather nicely. Yeah. You took the fancy cup. I yeah. did. Mateus was obvious. Actually, I'm going to give that to you because you're already out of water and I have my bottle here. So yeah, I'm yeah, going to yeah. let you drink that I one. I will provide it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and, mm. and now your pinky's not up, but I won't judge too much. This is, uh, this is uh, oh gosh, who was it that was my, my grandmother was telling me about? But somebody that would make her laugh all the time because he would take his tea and then do... <laughs> like that somebody somebody in Mexico I forget if it was one of her relatives or so, it's just it was just or, or it was a teacher maybe somebody that she knew anyway so we try to be very pretentious you know yeah um, so, and hello Luna yeah hello Luna but yeah let's let's actually take a moment because this is interesting obviously uh, I think most people know our stories but also Jesse and I came out of academic linguistics um, you had a very different academic background. Um, that is true, yes, yes, I do. I have a, uh, in terms of formal degrees, I have a bachelor's uh, degree in philosophy, I have a master's and a PhD in economic history. It's nothing to do with linguistics at all. I have, in fact, never taken a single formal linguistics class of any kind. As, like many conlangers, I'm entirely self taught on the basis of interesting language structure and in conlanging in general. I mean, so that also shows, I think, in certain respects, right, I'm not particularly good at phonology because, like, I don't know all the sort of technical uh, underlying who, stuff. Who should so. be good at that? And this is also why I asked for, like, a uh, podcast episode about syntax theory because, like, what is going uh, on with that, yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. things like that. But, of course, I do have the advantage of, like, being both from an academic family and having a good academic background. I can read academic papers pretty well, and that means... If you know how to scan these things in general, yeah, in almost yeah. any field, right? And yep. that certainly goes for linguistics. You can get, like, in typology and historical mm-hmm. linguistics, you can get a lot of information out of that without even being an expert. You pick yeah. up the terminology pretty well, I think, over time. And, of course, being active in the conlanging community helps with that also. And for me, these two things that really fed into each other were, like, the interesting linguistic structure and in historical linguistics and the interest in doing stuff with it for conlanging purposes. Mm-hmm. They really reinforce each other. The only thing I've not sort of gone into as much as some of the other conlangers do is a lot of language learning. That's something I'm in principle interested in, but it's just not something I tend to make a lot of time for. So for me, it's really more the structural stuff. But you kind of did it, though. 
right? I mean, in a sense, like I know English, as you can tell, and I can speak German pretty well, and I kind of yeah, have I languages. I figured being... you'd kind of have to, yeah. Yeah, yeah, my, my like, German yeah. is pretty decent. I have and a C1 certificate. I think your Dutch is pretty decent, too. Yeah, yeah. That, there's that. Uh, sometimes uh, it feels a so little rusty. So Matej is like, I'm not into speaking, learning a lot of languages, but I speak three. <laughs> yeah, like, did you did you learn German before uh, going to Germany, or? Yeah, yeah, so we having, uh, um, at least at the, the level of high school that I went to in the Netherlands, I went to very elite schools as well. Um, we have a German class, you tend to take a number of modern languages, as they say, as well as Latin and Greek. Mm. And um, They're still doing Latin and Greek, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the gymnasium level, they do Latin wow. and Greek. In the That's independent amazing. gymnasia, so I did both. I'm really I jealous, did my, by the way. Uh, That's done. I did final exam in Latin. Uh, mm. You can do either or both. Nice. I did Latin to the annoyings of my mother, who is an ancient Greece specialist and has never <laughs> fully forgiven me for this. Um, but anyway, yeah, and so you have also a couple of modern languages to go with it. English is obligatory, and then usually one of French and German, or sometimes nowadays they also offer occasionally like Spanish or Chinese or other kinds of things, but most commonly it's French or German. And so I did final exam in German also, uh, and then I didn't use it for years. But then when I moved to Germany, I had a decent basis for it, and I did an intensive German course at the Goethe Institute in Berlin. Mm. So I have an official C1 level certification in German wow. as well, which I thought would be you know, a useful thing to have on paper. And especially in Germany, if something is on paper, it's real. If it's not on paper, it's not real. So <laughs> it's very important that things are written down and have a stamp on them. So, sure. so I went out of my way to make that happen. And I also really use it regularly. Like I make a, a lot of my friends who live in Berlin especially, right? It's very international. And so people try to just get by with English, which you can certainly do. But I don't like that. I find it a little rude. Also, I enjoy, of course, u using languages. So I really use German whenever I can. Mm. And uh, I even have work meetings in German sometimes. And um, if uh, so branching off then, how and when did you come to Conlanging? Yeah, so like many people, I think as a teenager, I did some really terrible, like, you know, sort of imitation Conlangs. I remember um, when I was like, I don't know, 12, 13, 14, somewhere around there. I was definitely very inspired by the way that Latin and Greek are different from the Germanic languages I knew. And so I made some kind of conlang, which of course, similarly to I think many conlangers, I thought I was the only person who made their own languages what, and so on. Well, what era was this? Like what years were these? If you don't oh, mind. I was gonna say, I were gonna reveal how old I. Uh, no, that's okay. It's uh, somewhere in the late 90s, I think. Yeah, because right? so, yeah. Cause, cause it, I, and I know, I, I mean, I'm not trying to out you for your age, but I mean, it, it makes a difference because, mm -hmm. of course, like coming to language creation in the 90s, very, very different thing from like, uh, say, the mid 2000s. Very, very different thing 2011 later, you know? Yeah, very different in terms of like there being an internet community or things that you can hook into for sure. Yeah. I didn't have any of that. The only sort of exposure I had to conlanging was, of course, from Tolkien's works, which, mm -hmm. uh, as you know, un unlike you, I actually do like. Um, <laughs> right on. And, uh, you know, and that was, of course, something where I knew this. I knew about Esperanto existing because my grandmother, who was very much a sort of moral reformer type uh, in many respects, and she was also uh, an Esperantist, and had often tried to uh, push me into learning it. Really? Yeah, yeah, which I never did because what? as a kid oh, I had no oh. interest in it. I didn't see the point of any of it. Mm -hmm. It was very much associated with my grandmother who was this, you know, very sort of stereotypical overbearing Jewish grandmother, a little lady with big curly <laughs> hair and like, you know, getting in everybody's business and all that. Mm -hmm. So the fact that she was promoting it didn't necessarily endear it to me. Right. But, um, but so I knew that this existed at some level and of course I had an interest in learning how cases work and this inflection stuff and so like you get in Latin and Greek and so I made mm -hmm. a terrible language which is just so awful relax mixture, you know, typical kind of stuff. Um, I translated, translated uh, some bits of the Iliad into it, I remember. Really? Uh, yeah, 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 because Do again, you like, I grew up with, uh, you know, a mother who was a professor of ancient Greek history, my dad's an art historian, I grew up in a very sort of bourgeois culture and environment, so of course this is the sort of stuff that you first look to. And, um, and so I did some of that stuff. I had the paper for, papers for this uh, a mm -hmm. couple of years ago. I found them in a move, but I don't know if I kept them. But the, just to finish the story, then after that, I didn't do anything with that for a very long time. Um, I just you know, went in other directions, had other, got other interests and so on. But of course, I always had a, an interest in language as such and a sort of feeling for language with me. Quite good at languages, did really well in school, in language fields and so on, in grades and that kind of thing. I did some Latin in, at university as well. Uh, just as electives, I did a couple of like Latin translation classes, like Renaissance Latin, for example, where we did um, 
letters of Spinoza and stuff like this, just to keep up my level and sort of do something with language. Mm. Uh, but then for a long time, I didn't really know what to do with it in a way. And then at some point, I think it was mainly when I was doing my postdoc, I want to say, because I was incredibly unhappy with my job there. I hated this postdoc project. I hated my boss. I can tell him that now because <laughs> I don't work for him anymore. <laughs> and, um, and I just hated this whole thing. And I was very bored. And I was living in Leipzig, which is kind of a shithole. And so I was really looking for something to intellectually distract me in a way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when somehow I got into touch again with the idea of like people making languages. And I think I also started watching then your, your YouTube series where you did these individual videos mm -hmm. on like language creation, right? Which I guess is a sort of spin off from your book that you were doing. Yes. Yeah. But of course I didn't know that at the time. And so I started watching some of this stuff and then I got interested in that. And I got quite interested in linguistics sort of simultaneously with that mm -hmm. as like just a hobby, an intellectual thing to pursue that was unrelated to the most economic and anthropological stuff that I was working on, right? All this sort of crunchy social science stuff. And so I wanted some kind of intellectual hobby that was not related to that, but that would keep my mind engaged. And so linguistics was then something that I just started reading linguistics papers and trying to understand, like, you know, practicing IPA and trying to understand how, like, typology works and this kind of stuff. And that's, I think, how I then got into this. And then I got into the community, I think, via your videos and via, like, other people who are doing stuff on YouTube. Wow. Okay, so, uh, by the way, I wanted to uh, come back to this both as a request, but also in general, I want to mention this. Something that I think is very valuable and that I wish would be documented is um, the very first attempts at language creation, especially uh, for those who were not connected in any way to the community. So like, uh, you know, for example, it's, it's less interesting now if, you know, uh, you know, somebody says, I, like, I was interested in language creation, so I got the language construction kit, or mm -hmm. I got the art of language invention, and so I read that and started creating language. That is less interesting than somebody who was like, I came up with the idea and this is what I did. Not necessarily because that work is going to be any better. They're probably going to it's be equally not, bad. Yeah, yeah, it's but not. it's just, it, it's really fascinating because it was like, what does a person do if they have come up with this idea of creating their own language, something they never thought of before, and something that they have in general no experience with or little experience with, and don't even know that it's a thing, right? Um, what do they do? So Yeah, like if, I said, what I ended up doing is essentially like, you know, sort of trying to fill around with Latin and Greek case forms and just make essentially a relax of English. Mm -hmm. I think it was yeah. English actually rather than Dutch. Mm -hmm. um, that, or I can't remember, actually, maybe it was Dutch, I can't remember, but I relaxed something anyway, and then essentially give it this kind of faux, it was all even mm -hmm. like in terms of the word structure, so it was the phonology was very faux Latin. So it was very much like, oh, you know, this is apparently what other languages that are not, you know, English or Dutch or whatever are like. And of course, I did have some exposure to, you know, the existence of languages in a broader sense. I mean, the Netherlands is, of course, quite international in some respects. And I, because I was kind of bored at school, I also got some extra language classes. I did a little bit of Russian, for example, which, uh, so I did some, like, things to, like, just entertain myself with this stuff. So, and of course, I had a broad sense of, like, other languages existing. But Latin and Greek were really, for me, the model of, like, okay, here's a, a complicated language that does something different. And so if you do something different, it has to look like this. Sure. Yeah, well, this is what I would love for you to do. Again, this is going to take time, potentially, but it is something that I would be really interested in if you were interested in this. And it is the type of thing in general I would love for people to do this uh, and write it up and put it on Fiat Lingua. I would love for you to take those, you know, that original translation that you did of the, the Iliad, all of it, part of it, I don't care, but then kind of like write up an introduction to like what you were doing when you were creating this language, Talk about some of the choices you made as you were translated it. And, you know, you can frame it as in like, you know, yeah, I'm a much better conlanger now, and this is why this and this and this was a mistake. But it's like, if you could capture some of those original thoughts you had, like why you made the choices that you did, yeah. I think that's something that is very interesting. And it's something that kind of... It's really cool if that could be preserved and shared just so that... You I know, have to confess, yeah. I am not sure if I have those documents anymore because I have moved internationally many times and sure. gotten rid of a lot of stuff. But at the same time, I do remember this project quite well. And I have a, you know, you never know how reliable your memory is, but yeah, yeah. I have the sense that I remember quite a bit of right. what I was thinking when I was doing it. 
I even remember talking to my parents about it and so on and like showing them this and whatever. I think they were very bemused by it undoubtedly. Um, I do share with my parents, of course, an interesting language anyway, right? I mean, I also grew up in an intellectual environment where like, uh, you know, fascination, aesthetic appreciation for right. language is an important part of what we do. Um, my sister, for example, ended up getting a PhD in ancient Mesopotamian history. She teaches Sumerian and Assyrian now in the University of Leiden here in the Netherlands. So you know, there's also a linguistic um, aspect there. And so we all have a sort of shared appreciation for this kind of stuff. So it's also a combination of like, I really remember this being one of the main drivers for me, besides with the creativity of making your own project, was this kind of sense of like, you know, firstly, this language is differently structured than what I'm used to, which is really cool, right? It's interesting that you can do these things with languages, hey, cases are neat and all that stuff. And secondarily, the kind of foam aesthetics that is, and the kind of prestige associated with something being old and prestigious like Latin and Greek, mm -hmm. right? The idea of like, oh, this is all based in old texts, this is all based in like you know, old materials that have been preserved through the ages. The kind of historical dimension of this has always been very cool to me which is also why the uh, kind of setting I'm using now for my own conlanging is something, you know, historical. It's not based in Earth, but it's, you know, it's like a historical kind of setting, and it, it, it's deliberately very historically layered, because I really love that kind of, like, here's an old manuscript, here's an old song, you know, here's, here's an epic from X era, you know, yeah, here's yeah, the, chron yeah. the chronicle of the whatever. You know, this kind of, there's this whole historical dimension that, to me, uh, more and more also as I learned about linguistics, the kind of historical aspect of historical linguistics to me is as interesting as the linguistic aspect mm -hmm. of it. And that's just also, I am from a family of historians. It's for me, yeah. interesting yeah. things is always very important part historically driven. Um, shoot, I hope Bubba didn't go, uh, just, I hope he's still, through, uh, got a, uh, oh, bye, Bubba. he had a question. What are the birthplaces of languages have more dialects than the other place? Oh, well, Bubba, I think there are a couple of misconceptions there. So. Um, and I don't know how to quite tease apart all of that, but um, well, that's not really true. And also, no. what, what is the birthplace of a language? Like, no, I have no idea. That's not a concept that really exists as such, right? I mean, you have a more high amount of proto languages, but that's just an arbitrary point that we cut off at. Yeah, yeah. That doesn't really mean anything because, as such, right? Because, because yeah. we just can't go any further than that. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't go further than and that, right? And of course, yeah. English wasn't actually born in England. It was. It migrated yeah, it's there. Like <laughs> North, North German, South yeah. Danish, right? Essentially, yeah. and it's like, yeah. which is why Frisian is the closest language still to that. Right. So, right. so Bubba, when you go back and, and watch this, there are a, a, a kind of a number of layered misconceptions here, and like one of them, uh, and this is actually something that pervaded in American linguistics, was that basically the further west you got from England, the fewer and fewer dialects there were. Um, and accents. And in fact, if they're like in linguistics, in linguistics dialectology, in like the 60s and 70s, they would show how like, oh, New York City has like, you know, 18 different accents and they're separated by borough. But then basically when you got to the Mississippi River, they said everybody to the West speaks the same dialect. And that wasn't a joke. Like literally they would say everybody to the West speaks the same dialect. Even though they had been to Minnesota, I had heard people there. Well, Minnesota's to the East, isn't it? Wait. Of the Mississippi? Uh, yeah. It's to the west. Yes. Yeah. Son of a gun. Wow. Well, like it, it, it actually like kind of curves into it at the very top, but like the straight line up, you you have Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri. Well, thank you for correcting me. For out American <laughs> stating <laughs> David. I, I know, I've been to quite a lot of the US. So I yeah. know the country pretty well. But no, that's that's actually like that's one hundred percent true. Like they have maps too, where they would show like here are the dialects of the United States, and it's like east of the Mississippi there, it's like boom, 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 boom. West of the Mississippi, it was just one. Um, that's and, wild, yeah. Yeah, and it's just. It, I guess it's, Hollywood helped here because now everybody's familiar with that California accents, Valley Girl, all this kind of is, stuff, right? The sort of cultural I mean, associations. It goes, it goes with that. further back though because mm -hmm. it's with migration. It's like you know the people who ended up settling the western part of the United States were a mixture of all these eastern dialects coming together and then settling in these weird settlements. Mm. Um, and I say weird because they weren't cities, right? So they weren't the same kind of concept. Mm. And so everything just got bleached as it crossed the river and people just mingled all together. It wasn't, there was no community to keep your accent but in certain you know, places, right? I mean, you're, you've spent a lot of time in Texas, and you still have, like, the Texas German there and things like the this, The South right? is 
different. Well, but the all, South is its own thing. Also, the thing is that there are tons of different accents over there. But yeah, in Texas, there actually in, are very many accents. Well, and in, in different parts of the West, but they just weren't considered to be as different or unique yeah. enough to be noteworthy. Yeah. And, and that was really... Yeah. And this is, of course, always with dialects, right? It's like when people ask, like, okay, how many dialects or whatever. There is no sort of objective answer to yeah. that, right? Yeah. There is always, you, you sort of, you're a splitter or a merger or whatever, but you kind of, like, have I to draw lines. I also think it's or, harder to just find studies because you, you've got fewer universities the further west you go in, in as much concentration. It's like you've got a university here, and then you've got to drive three hours to get to the next university just because there's not as many people. And so it's like... So it's an artifact of the researchers. Right. Here, like here. It's also yeah. like I don't think people have really gone into as much depth except for people who are potentially from those areas and start noticing that there is some difference. Um, I just I don't think it's the same kinds of differences that got studied in the earlier days of dialectology that... And especially now, like now, those same accents that were described in such details that are so different are like when people hear the the examples, pronunciations are like, yeah, my grandparents say it that way, but I don't. Yeah. And it's so, I mean, it's getting lost. It's, yep. you know, it's not quite part, the same. Part of that is actually, uh, it's seen in a lot of institutions in America, this bizarre um, East Coast bias. Uh, mm -hmm. where it was simply considered like this is the where important things happen and then if something's happening out west we'll we'll hear about it later um, and it shows up in all kinds of bizarre ways like including that yeah in linguistics you know the important work of course was happening at MIT and Harvard uh, and then you know other places it's like well all right um, if you have something interesting, then you report it to us, and we'll, yeah. we'll take There's a look a at it. Ivy League kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, and then like in this was a big complaint in in college sports in particular. Where like in professional sports, it's like all right, there's a there's a playoff. It's based on record, and then every, all the teams play against each other, and you see who's the best one. But like in college sports, there were so many colleges that they had this ranking system that was done by. Uh, reporters who would then, you know, they would say like, oh, okay, you know, this team beat this team, but the team they beat wasn't very good, so maybe they only get, you know, uh, that win doesn't mean as much as this other oh, really? win. They had some kind of subjective ranking. Of like, oh, yeah, they had to because there's like a hundred different teams. Yeah, right? but the way you do that is like in chess. You make the, you know, they use the ELO system, which this Hungarian guy came up with. Everybody always thinks ELO is an acronym, but it's like a last name. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, they have essentially this kind of mathematical rating system, right? Where you yeah. essentially the quality of sort of your win against somebody determines how many rating points you gain or lose and so on. And so you actually end up sort of equilibrating all of people's positions uh, if they play yeah. often enough. And there there was kind of a thing like that, but the thing was what would happen is that teams on the West Coast would play each other and they would play each other so late that the reporters on the East Coast would go to sleep before the games were finished. Mm -hmm. And so they just hear about what happened afterwards and they would have already made so their like rankings. So it was like Dewey defeats Truman sort of like. Yeah, yeah. It, and it, it is. And it was just the type of thing where it's just like, okay, well consistently all the teams on the East Coast were just considered to be, of course, better. Uh, of course, because you know, they know all of them and they're, and they're playing, it's like, so it's like, the, and what would happen is like in a 12 game season, right? Somebody on the East Coast who went nine and three would be considered a better team than somebody on the West Coast that went 11 and one because of course they were playing better teams because they know all the teams, they pay attention to them and it's like, oh, if something happens over there or whatever, you know? There is also, I think now it, it's different, but in general media, um, cause I remember growing up, there were things, um, that were starting to be done more live. Um, but of course, I never lived in a time zone where they were actually live, because it was then aired an hour later where I lived. Oh, yeah, and they would yeah. never would have been live for you either, because it would have been three hours later <laughs> for you. But it was things like, you know, we technically were watching a not live mm -hmm. ball drop of New Year's Eve. Right, right. Um, if there were things where it's like you could call in and actually like oh, right, interact right. with mm -hmm. the show in some way, well, you never could if you weren't live because they would only take the calls or the responses or the votes if you were watching it live. Um, and so they had to like really monitor for that in shows like that were developed later, like So You Think You Can Dance and things like that, where they wanted America to vote. 
they had to essentially say, well, you'll get a results show the next night because there was no way to air it in all the time zones and get people to vote in, during this, you know, the actual streaming of it. Um, but it's like, you know, it, it is. There was a, a bias for, well, we're going to do it in the first time zone and all you other time zones are just... Which just proves my point, which is that America is too large and should be split into pieces. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. Like a normal country size is roughly the Netherlands, right? Anything that's and larger than that is historically that's tolerable. The, that's if, like, the one you're going for. Yeah, it just so happens that that is, that, that is the convenient one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you know, it's about three hours in every direction, and sort of that's about a good size for a country. And you can tolerate a few bigger yeah, ones just for bad. economic balance, and then, you know, okay. But nothing bigger than that, right? We need to split this stuff up. <laughs> it, is, it is such an interesting, uh, just different conception of country, because of course, coming from the the too big country, like it, it was always so bizarre to me to think like, oh, in like four hours, you could be in a totally different country. And this comes from my perception of living where I live, because of course, like where David grew up, that probably wasn't as bizarre because you could get to Mexico relatively mm. quickly. Mm -hmm. Whereas where I grew up, you had to work to get to another country. To another country, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> you either had to go, <laughs> gosh, how many hours would that be to get north to Canada? And then many more hours south to yeah. uh, Mexico would have been much further just because Texas is so doggone big. Probably like 12 hours up, right, or something like that. I want to say it's probably going to be more than that. Maybe now I'm curious. Than... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to map this. Apparently there's um, half-hour differences in Australia. Yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah, they do yeah. have the half-hours, yeah. That's something I'd never seen until I went to India. Yeah, so India has them, right? That's the only other yeah. country I know of that does half-hours. <laughs> Isn't there, like, something that does 15? Probably. I, I wouldn't be surprised I like there somewhere. Is. There's a lot of shenanigans like that happen. Paul or something. I can't remember. I'm going to see if I can... Will they just give me the driving distance? No. What, what's a, a border Canadian city? Oh, um, Hamilton, Ontario. Yeah. Uh, but that would be directly north of... Oh, Waterloo, right? Is Missouri. Right on, oh, directly north of... I don't think there's anything up there. Was that Zutbury or something? I mean, they've got to have some town. Yeah, probably, but like, you know. Uh, I was thinking, wasn't Winnipeg close to the Yeah, point? see, that's it. That you know, it says, like, Nepal is 5.45. Yeah, see, I, I had this memory of this being a 15-minute thing. Um, no, Winnipeg is, like, above what? North Dakota. No, yeah, what... what that was, yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was thinking of Winnipeg. What What exactly is the question you're asking? Well, I... First of all, yeah, this, is, this is real good television when you're all on your phone in front right of the camera. Right here, really like, Southern that. Ontario is what I'm looking for. But, but like... It's it's so close. Like well, you, you mean like right on the border? Or like Thunder Bay or something? Just to get it's, to another country. I was trying to like not the point overestimate. The point, I was yeah. trying to say if I was really desperate and I got in my car from where I grew up. So Missouri? Hold on. So if you were from right there and you were going, yeah, Thunder Bay. I okay. would say Thunder Bay. I know, right? A stream at a reason, well, reasonable hour for reasonable people. Who would ever have guessed <laughs> that such a thing could exist in the LTS verse? If I if I were to drive to Winnipeg, it would have been a fifteen hour drive. Yeah, okay, that wasn't too far off. So. Yeah. See, in the Netherlands, it's like I think three hours is about the longest you could do. You have to kind of really go out of your way to do it. Like you'd have to go from Maastricht, you know, sort of like diagonally across to like Den Helder or something, or maybe even to one of the islands. But that, you know, that might be about three hours, but even that's pushing it probably. Yeah. By the way, regarding, I, I wanted to mention this because I think it's it's something that sometimes gets lost. We may have mentioned it on the stream before, but regarding like Hollywood and the, and the accent, you know, getting spread across, it's something very interesting because um, it really wasn't a factor until the 50s. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is because of, of, of cinema verite, basically. Uh, a, a cinema from like the 20s through the 40s, uh, and this goes for both film and also television, actors performed as if they were on stage in a play. Mm. And so accent was really negligible for the most part, unless somebody was specifically brought in to do like some sort Maybe of the caricature or whatever, yeah. accent. Yeah. Because they, uh, this was when serious actors were taught like this, you know, mid-Atlantic, you know, general American dialect, yeah. were trained to perform in a certain ac accent. And it's why when you watch older movies from like the 30s and 40s, you, you'd be like, you know, these characters coming in. <laughs> I say, how are you doing there? 
Well, I'm all right. How are you doing? It's like, well, I don't know about that. That's uh, quite a thing that you just said. Well, it's just what we're going to do right now, and so on. This very kind of like overly theatrical, mm -hmm. I'm putting on a voice to perform. It was in the 1950s where they, it, this idea started like, we're going to try to get real people talking in a real way about like real things, and it was going to be like gritty and stuff. And that was suddenly where you started seeing actual like regional varieties and accents making its way into film. And then that pretty much took over, especially in TV. And you started seeing this shift, especially in the 50s, between movies and shows where it's like they were doing that old theatrical performance and then also the new stuff where they were just speaking and eventually it just took over. And it's why also you see with a lot of older actors, they feel kind of out of place. Mm. Later on, when you start watching things in the 70s and 80s, when they're still doing that kind of thing, you know? Um, and a great example is actually uh, Murder, She Wrote, because Angela Lansbury, I mean, she was in the height of, you know, that era. Uh, she was in the movie, by the way, um, Gas Lamp, uh, Gaslight. Uh, the actual famous. The yeah. actual movie Gaslight, where the, the, the phrase came from. But it's like, when she's doing Murder, She Wrote, she's still very much performing, you know? which makes the show feel very dated. Yeah, this kind of self-aware way of doing it, right? Yeah, like, and like by the time, because so, the show was still airing in the early 90s, by that time, it was just so dated mm -hmm. that it was like, you know, when they were saying, you know, when they were telling her, because there was this famous episode later on, or infamous episode, where she's essentially lampooning friends because she was like, they were telling her like, well, people like this kind of thing, and she just thought it was ridiculous. Some show like Friends, where all these people are just talking about things like their periods and whatnot, and it's like, why would anybody watch that? <laughs> um, but it's like the very idea that a Murder, She Wrote style show was being aired at the same time as like Friends is mind boggling, because the styles are so dramatically different. And I will say know? not just performing styles and not just concept styles but like wardrobe uh -huh. the the actors oh God, they yeah. hired uh -huh. i mean there are definitely episodes that because you know we're doing a, a watch right now with uh, david's sister and so we're in the later season so at this point it's 90s yeah um and when you look at the clothing and stuff it's like god that is 80s through and through and like early 80s like it's that it, it really looks like it got stuck in the early 80s for the the high fashion of early yeah. 80s um and so yeah it's just it's so bizarre to me because then you look at that in terms of just the aesthetics and costume wardrobe everything and compare that to other shows going on because seinfeld would have been also yep. right around uh -huh. then um and and you try to compare it and it's so bizarre to me i actually had a funny thing like this with when we were watching dune too because like Especially because there's so much Chakopsa in it, and like you know, they obviously have this kind of attempt to doing what would represent a Fremen accent and things mm -hmm. like this. And then every now and then you get like Timothée Chalamet, like very glib American English, sort of in between <laughs> doing this proper yeah, yeah, Hollywood yeah. lying every now and then, right? Yeah. And then you have a lot of like you know Chakopsa, and then he has this like Hollywood delivery. You get. <laughs> like actually, to me, this was a very odd and almost a little bit sort of taking you out of the film kind of contrast at that point, where almost a Fremen, you know, sort of Chakopsa stuff feels more natural. And like, what's this American <laughs> doing here? <laughs> it was very funny. Um, um, and I will say there is... Hey, Magpie, Jonathan, Miles, everybody's here. Murder, Aww, Murder She Wrote mind. is not being slandered, I promise you. David loves that show oh, yeah. through and through, I promise you. Just just remarking on there are some very big differences um, when you look at the era. Uh, yeah, and in fact, it's, it's actually a very good comparison to make because a lot of not just character actors, but also famous actors yeah. were on Murder, She Wrote. And, As uh, their career was starting in many yeah, places. Yeah, like for example, since we're talking about Friends, Courtney Cox. Courtney Cox was on Murder, She Wrote. And you can see Courtney Cox on Friends and then on Murder, She Wrote and the characters she was playing. Like she doesn't have a huge role, but it's like, yeah, the performance style is different. It's like, that's Courtney Cox, but it's like, why is she talking like that? <laughs> Whereas like on Friends, you know, obviously it's a comedic thing and there's that, but it's like she's more of a human, you know? <laughs> Like I, it's it's like Murder, She Wrote is like a stage production, yeah, uh, but filmed every week. 
And it and yeah, there is definitely a different quality. But yeah, no, I have seen every episode at one time or another, and then now rewatching it with David, it's been a lot. You of see fun. a similar thing also with um, Twelve Angry Men, the original film and the remake. Oh right? yeah. yeah, the contrast between them. I mean, the original I think is better, but but also like it's so noticeable in how different. You know, it's obviously the same lines and the same play and so on, mm-hmm. but like the television style has changed mm-hmm. so much in how yeah. delivery is done. Yeah. Anyway, so a bunch and of people are here now. Yeah, yeah everybody's hey, here. Hey, Bib, and happy Bib anniversary of, of the, the battle, battle of the Pilling Our Fields, of course. To you, too. Yeah, to of you course. So, yes. Of course. Uh, I, um, you because know, David, as you know, the number one Tolkien expert and appreciator here, knows exactly what we're talking about. Oh, that's uh, a Tolkien thing. I just assumed it was an actual history thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Same thing, really, right? <laughs> as far as I'm yeah. concerned. Oh, yeah. No, Con Langry, those are some good shows. I, yeah. I could oh. also call you George. Oh, it's George. <laughs> it is George. George was here earlier also. I yeah. Uh, by the was way. Was Ross Perot? I don't think so, but now I'm going to look it up just to find out. Maybe. maybe. Later later today, uh, George will, of course, be uh, streaming uh, Tongues and Runes, so check that out. Um, but what was I going to say? Brian Cranston is also on Murder, She Wrote. <gasps> yes. Um, yes. And also, a couple of times. Um, and one that I was super surprised to see him because we wouldn't have otherwise recognized him, I don't think, except for the fact that I happened to see his name in the beginning credits. Um, what's his name? Jane, uh, Jim Cavazio. Uh, Jim Caviezel. That's how you pronounce it, sure. Uh, That's it's also how he pronounces it. Guess, but, um, yeah. Sorry, I never really, I only saw it in writing. But anyway, He looks him, pretty young. But he looks so different. Like, honestly, I never would have known that was him if... Nice Logan. I if appreciate I just that. Oh, it, it's the uh, the old Ides of the March. Old, old Ides of March. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, it, we uh, you know we're told when we're told about that in the U.S., we have no idea that Ides is supposed to be you know fifteenth in Latin. So it's like we think that it was some sort of event. Like if you talk about like you know, uh, always, Sylvester or like, you know, Ramadan, it's like the Ides, it's yeah, like some yeah. sort of long stitching. Well, well, I yeah. always thought it was something like how we have April Fool's Day, where it's just this known sure. day of a month that has some special meaning attached to it. And it's like, yeah, the 15th, it's the Ides of March. I mean, sometimes it did, right? Because it is this mid calendrical point. I mean, it's, it, that's, but they did it more in the kind of medieval way where you say like it was seven days after since Sylvester or, so, you know, yeah. this kind of thing. It's more like that. Yeah, and so, like, it's just, you know, it, I was very taken aback when I learned that it was just the word for 15th. So I'm like, why don't you just yeah, say Yeah, they just 15th? have a word for this midpoint in the month, right, that we don't, <laughs> we just don't do that. <laughs> yeah. But that was, of course, the whole, you know, retroactive prophecy about it and so on. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, uh, we haven't really accomplished some specific thing, but it is around the time that we usually I enjoy I do think, yeah, we have a Kobe little... Co. We have a little special treat that it is Something now my different. privilege to bring, which I will show on the camera if we can actually yes, see it. Yes, because <laughs> Mateus did eat a Copico in September for us. I did, yeah. yeah. So we had this little okay, back yeah, and yeah, forth yeah, on yeah, this. Good, yeah, because, um, yeah, basically they made me eat Copico. I hate coffee. I hate <laughs> coffee flavor. I hate <laughs> coffee flavored candy especially. But when I went to you know our, our little convention, of course, I was willing to eat it. But that also means that I now have the right to exact revenge, essentially. <laughs> and I do that here in the Netherlands with something very appropriately Dutch, which is this is the double salt licorice. This is uh, one of the sort of stronger varieties of salt licorice that you oh, can shoot. get in the regular How much water you got left, babe? And uh, so I'm going to want you yours. to eat uh, this. No, this is, I here. was prepared. You do not get all my water. By the way, I've been asked, uh, Miles says, could we have David try to pronounce the brand name first? Uh, well, Miles, sure. Klenna. Pretty easy. But I'm sure that's not what you meant. Uh, this is not the brand name. This is actually what it is. So this is... Um, Klinger, I would say. Uh, what? Klinger, I would say, with a long A. Say this again? Klinger. For the first one, the first eight. Did you have a month. feeler nasal there? No. Say it again. I, I just have a cold, right? So that that's not going to make your alveolar nasal velar cling. You're I'm absolutely saying a velar nasal. Am I? Yes. I, I'm hearing it too because I thought huh. it doesn't have one as far as I know. But no, I would ascribe that to my cold. So but I don't. so clean up. Kling. The point is, it's okay. like a, a longer a. It's like Kling. a stressed a. So it's like it's not Kling. Kling, but it's cling. 
Yeah, everybody's okay. hearing the velar nasal. Um, but yeah, this I had this problem. Uh, I have a friend who lives in Austria whose name is um, L E N A, and so Lena. Yeah, I would say Lena. Uh, whereas uh, oh, yeah. Lena, IPA, yeah. you look here. I'm gonna write this out. Lena. Yeah. Um, and I had this issue with her as well, um, but basically. I would okay, say this is going to be a marker that bleeds through eight pages. I would say this maybe with that, and you are saying this quite clearly. See, that's what I heard too. So I heard like if I were to compare it to an English word, cling is what I heard. Kind of yeah. cling it is cling, kind of, cling. Yeah, is kind of what I was hearing at first, but this I believe is what you're saying is clay, but, cleaner, yeah, but with a broader cleaner. tongue. Cleaner. Cleaner, yeah. But so cleaner Clean. is how I would say that. What I hear you saying is cleaner. No, no, I, I would definitely like, you know, long A is how it. Anyway, you were anyway, anyway, meant to read here the we description. Go. So uh, just this is uh, what this is. And this is, of course, um, um, Sir Kebre. Sirk, oh my god. Sirker, Sirker Bray, Sirker Bray, um, du, uh, Dubelzult, Dubelzulte. I, I have no idea how. Dubelzulte? Dubelzulte. Okay, and then Sirker Bray, how did I do? Sirker Bray. Oh, oh, but because uh, it's Dutch, not German, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it, it's so hard to unlearn the German right. where it's like, no, you actually just pronounce it the but way But you would it never is. see these vowel combinations in German, right? No, so, I know, but okay, it's, okay. Sirke, um, Sirke, Sirke Vrij. Yeah, Sirke Vrij. Sirke Vrij. So you would stress the last Vrij because it's free, free of sugar. So Sirke Vrij. Oh, it's, this is sugar? Sugar yeah, free. sugar free. This is, is sugar what free. It says. Yeah. How do you live in this country, and this is how you pronounce sugar? Sugar. Yeah. That's, that's terrible. That you should sugar. immediately leave. Mm, I did. I mean, he I did. Yeah. Yes, you did. Sirke, sirke vrij, sirke vrij, dubbelzote, dubbel, dubbelzote, and then dubbelstenen. Dubbelstenen. Yeah. Which are dice. Oh. What's are Dice, as in uh, that you throw. Right, so they're like double like, is the word for playing dice. So they're dice really? stones. Yeah. I was gonna say stainen is stone. Yeah. Yeah. So they're stones, plural stainen. Yeah. yeah. How about and that? Doubling is like essentially the, a verb for playing dice. So wow. And again, though, I heard you say stainen. Stainen. But there's a that velar nasal again. You sure you're not saying e? I'm very sure I'm not saying e. Not in this, my not in my phonetic register. That is this not This is why e. every time e. like we have an e, which is like spelled i e, right? Okay. And how would you say that between an s t and an n? Stein. Stein. Okay. Versus stein. 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 Okay. Okay. Yeah. Ooh, I gotta get the du the Dutch vowels utilize so much of the vowel space. Oh, they really do. Yeah, it's like it's, it's really all over, right? For it's, me, it's, it's, it's like my goes. ears really struggle to differentiate because yeah. I'm not used Everybody. to it. It really also makes distinctions that are very odd, right? Uh, by the way, how do you make the font size bigger? On the um, chat. Here, there let me let me just good. try just something. Just because a lot of people are, I think, I'm even wearing glasses and they're looking at me leaning forward oh, yeah, and yeah, squinting yeah. my eyes. How's that? Uh, See, that's, that's a little bit better. I'm with Matthias here. Do you need a one more? At best, but nothing further back than that. See? Did you see what Tethys then? Kling. Uh, yeah, I guess so. People hear it as in, uh, yeah. Also, though, you, you keep saying E instead of A. Yeah, no, it's really an A. I mean, but I think our A might be a little high. Uh, yeah, possible. high enough that it's not that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, it really is, though, because, uh, like I said, there is a, we have a phonemic distinction there, is right? Is that too so, like, big? That's or? good. Uh, that's good? Okay. But, yes, yeah, so you can always ask a question, um, Sir Squilliam. Of course. Uh, it's not like really anything important. Let's see. Oh, we hope it works because you <laughs> watered down the David content of the day because it's even stronger. Exactly, <laughs> Audi, yes. We're, we're uh, All right. still. And so here we go. I know, right? Biles, maybe he could, but, uh, yeah. We have a, a die for you. 
Ooh. Yeah, so these are die shaped, that's the point. I really love this stuff. This is why it's already half eaten, because I really had to restrain myself from eating All right. the whole of this it, stuff. Yeah. Go ahead and grab yours and, yeah. uh, and, we'll get and, cheers. and cheers. 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 Cheers to that. Yeah. Um, okay, um, Matthias, sorry to go. Doppelsteinen, the yeah, so official th- treat of the of Langtime Studio when we present in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. Okay, here we go. That's exactly what Charlie Carrot says. Like you have to it's integrate here. It's quite chewy. Oh, this is terrible. Mm, this is delicious. This is awful, but um, like you have to understand, not anywhere nearly as bad as what I had. No, I believe that because this is like I said, this is the strongest sort of mainstream one you would get in a regular supermarket. Mm -hmm. There are stronger varieties, but you have to really look for them. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So this is, usually they they sell this as sort of the far salt range, and then we have a whole variety of liquors. So you can get um, sweeter ones, you can get things with harder surfaces, things with softer surfaces, more chewy, more melty. Mm -hmm. We do a whole range of these things. I'm actually struggling most with like just mm. chewing it. LTS, I know. I'm worried my my teeth are gonna pull out. Uh, yeah, it'll, it'll take me a while so to actually finish it. It's not as bad as uh, you know what I tried in in Orus, but mm. um, but you know I'm surviving. I, so I can just you know sit here and plainly say I don't like this. This is a very bad taste, but it's extremely delicious. Yeah, I'm gonna probably eat the whole rest of it. But I'm not dying. I'm gonna. I'm gonna say you should go for that, Mateus, and I'm gonna lean off camera as I like try to get this off my tooth. It's totally stuck. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta keep uh, turning it over. Oh, awful! It's just getting worse. Um, mm-hmm. It's I, maybe um, the aftertaste, especially nice, because you get all that zombiac development in your mouth and in your throat. It's really nice. This is awful. Um, That's what I love about it. This is truly, truly awful. Sorry, Miles. That is really an unfortunate sound to to hear. Um, but it is oh God, yeah, a very a, sticky, chewy. It is that, yeah. yeah. Mm. I, I, I was going to bring the other variety, which is like these big balls. This is, um, they are like mm. big balls, and they're filled on the inside with mm. this kind of salvia powder. They're also extremely delicious. This is terrible. It reminds me of um, when I'm at the beach. Um, well, that you, is terrible, yeah. And you accidentally, like, you know, get knocked, and you swallow salt water. And it, it kind of shoots up your nose. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see the comparison there, but with Which the difference of that this is tasty. Yeah. No, it's not. This is really, really bad. Yeah, this is just delicious, actually. Yeah. Oh God, it's getting worse. Yeah, this is the thing that really develops over time. This is why you keep eating them because I it really builds up. I really wish we had something else to eat. Yeah, this mm-hmm. is terrible. Oh, wait, we do. We have more. This is inexcusably awful. Like I can't mm-hmm. even believe that I've done this. Mm-hmm. I can. I'm watching wow. it right now. But, but you're There's actually reacting the... less violently than you do to other things. So Logan, it's... I bet it's not as bad as artichoke dip. Get out of here. Artichoke dip is delicious. Everybody, I was going to say, oh. I love artichoke dip. Um, okay, it's an acquired taste, so therefore acquire it. That's a very good point. <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah, with the program. Oh. You, you have a little bit there. You finish what you brought because mm-hmm. I need as much water as possible. And you not being prepared should not result in me not being able to drink Ooh. water. I'm going to have another one. I'm actually going to... So um, okay, you can have my last drink if you want. That's how much I love you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to... This is now a, a, mu- a refill. mukbang stream or whatever I call it. Find anything else to eat. <laughs> As we like raid their mm-hmm. supplies. Mm. The only that thing is... I've ever tasted that was physically incapable of swallowing. Like, that is such a setup for a joke that I'm having a really hard time not getting rude mm. here, but I will restrain myself because Arayaz is here, so you know, <laughs> I, have to be, I have to be polite. Oh, exactly, okay. Arayaz. Also, this I was suggesting actually earlier when Jesse and David and I were talking uh, before the stream, that we need to get more clickbait into LTS, right? Mm-hmm. So we need to have these, like, big capital letters. It should be like... Comrade are shocked by results, you know, or whatever. And mm-hmm. then, like, you know, you have to have this this face of David going like, huh? what? You know? And then, like, some you know, irritating kind of yes. like sort of cut out bits of the stream that are like, you know, in pasted in the background. And then you need to cut our streams into like little ten minute chunks, each of which is titled yeah, yeah, yeah. like that, yeah. and put into some kind of playlist. And then you need to, you know, have some kind of crappy advertisement for better help that you spend the first five minutes of every episode. Obviously. On. Or, uh, you know, Raid Shadow Legends or something right. great like yes, that. Yes. This is really, I think, the direction that LTS should be taken. 
I got to say, the um, now that the salt has died down and is no longer invading my nostril, That's I do like more, the, yeah. the licorice flavor. Um, so I do enjoy a black licorice flavor. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's, I, I don't think I need it with salt. I just... The salt really adds to it because I don't actually like... I think single salt would be fine. They do have single salt. Um, I, I think the double salt is There are different degrees of this, but for me, it's like I find the sweet stuff is just like kind of like just sweet candy and I don't care that much for it. It's really the salt thing that kicks your ass that I find interesting about it. It's also interesting in a similar way that like chili is interesting, right? Mm-hmm. Where it's like it has this particular mm-hmm. masochistic enjoyment and I'm all about masochistic enjoyment, so. There is well, that. the I will say the skeleton shaker was so salty that I didn't even taste black licorice. Like that's how salty. Yeah, and it's it probably is. also a little bit like a gimmick then, right? Yeah, because yeah. It's very much sort of like okay, where you know, like you have similar with chili again, where you have certain right. things where they just try to overpower you. You don't really get the chili flavor or the development. And at the end of it, it's just like your whole mouth is burned off, and you're like, "But I did it." I've uh, put in a request to get like anything. <laughs> it was. Actually, yeah, so more licorice. It thing. was yeah. quite. I'm sure, they have some. Oh, that was the thing. I went in there and asked, like, if they had any candy or anything like that. And somebody got up, went over to the shelf, and brought over a container of black salt licorice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but this is this is Hi, wonderfully cold How water, and I love it. Good to see you, buddy. <sighs> oh. It'll it'll help get the the salt out. I do think artichoke is a fun word to say, though. I mean, I don't know if it's an appetizing word to say, but it is a very fun word to say. Bill Viridian's not a fan. Of, of artichokes? Of the name. The word artichoke. Oh. Is objecting to Bill Viridian is artichoke. saying it's almost as bad as yogurt. Yogurt is the worst. Artichoke, in name, although we also know that Bill Viridian does not like yogurt. He also either, the food. Uh, he also doesn't like coffee, is that right? Or, or tea. I know that he doesn't tea. like tea. Um, I don't feel like... I don't know. Uh, I don't feel like Bibleridine is a coffee drinker. Yeah, um, Patrick, I'm I'm really sorry. Uh, that all does of sound us, horrible. Yeah, all like, of us um, are. You know, we were really invested in your apartment specifically, and we thought it was fine, but evidently maintenance was required. Yeah, I mean, Patrick is such a fussy guy, right? He's all the time complaining about the apartment. And I like know, it's just fixed. It's really every <laughs> single stream. Anyway, uh, and so I actually called up your super and said, I need you to do some surprise maintenance on Patrick's apartment. And um, honestly, he jumped at the chance. Uh, and um, I, only had a, I only had to pay him like $150 to, to do that, which I think is great. And so... Um, so yeah, uh, he'll be there for some time, uh, hammering. Yeah, we also tried to get the big drill out, so maybe that will that will come later. Yeah. yeah. By the way, and Tethys, this means I can learn Turkish doubly good then, because I like both. I like yogurt. Yeah. So not coffee though. Uh, but you know, one thing that Bibleridian is on board, you know, where where Bibleridian and I really really uh, share is that we both love ice cream. Um, Which is, you know, objectively disgusting, let's be honest. It's like, you're so in the minority there that it's not even a joke. That um, is the joke, though. Yeah. <laughs> also, how does this keep... Wait, no, wait. What? Never mind, never mind. Never mind. Did it, your brain it doesn't have a keep. Little, little smash? Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. No, yeah, I, I'm, I'm back. I'm, 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 I'm okay. I'm okay. Patrick, you know that about me, that I don't eat ice cream? Come on. Oh, uh, that, that, you know, we just actually had this conversation earlier about how I don't like chocolate ice cream, and I don't like chocolate cake, and I really don't like Oreos. Uh, Although David eats a lot more chocolate ice cream than his not liking it would suggest, mainly because I love it so much yep. that he eats it. Uh-huh. Um, and so it's not that he doesn't get some enjoyment out of it, because you do enjoy some of that chocolate ice cream. Don't even lie. It's just not his favorite. Uh, well, I'll tolerate it as a vehicle if it has interesting things in it, but um, like I prefer It's my vanilla. favorite. Like plain chocolate ice cream would be right up there up top, and then anything you add to it that could make it better, mm. like coffee bits. Yeah. Do All we right. have uh, right another curious. linguistic topic we should broach? 
That is Are theoretically... you saying that chocolate uh, ice cream is... Actually, no, this is what I, I wanted to talk about. I mean, since this entire stream is about you, do you want to tell As us a most bit? streams ought to be, really. Uh, yeah, do you, do you want us to tell us a bit about your streaming, like what like what you do? And Oh, yeah, well, I haven't done it in quite, in quite some time now because I've been quite busy with other stuff going on. Mm -hmm. It's very uh, time-consuming and energy-consuming mm -hmm. also. But I have done some game streaming on uh, on my Twitch account, McCain and L, which is why David is always making fun of me because then I had to change my YouTube name so that I could make a VOD channel for it. I should probably make a separate VOD channel so that David can shut up about it. That's right. <laughs> but that will happen at some mm -hmm. future point when I can actually be bothered. But uh, yeah, if you want to watch me at twitch.tv slash mckingnl, then occasionally, probably when I next lose my job, which may be at any point in the next month or so, then uh, I will probably be streaming again. And uh, I play all sorts of like things like RPGs and indie games, strategy uh, games, can, can city builders. Can you give us some examples? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've played a fair amount of like Turingy recently because uh, a friend of mine tried to get me to play through it. I haven't gotten super far with it. I was working my way through the Shadowrun games, which I think are excellent computer games. Oh. The PC RPG games, I mean, based on the Shadowrun setting, they made three um, sequential, sort of each, each one bigger and longer, that are based in that setting in different parts of the world. And I think they're really excellent games, and uh, I was making my way through those. Uh, I was intending to stream some Cataclysm Dark Days Ahead, mm. a very interesting uh, zombie survival roguelike game that I like a lot and it's very addictive. Mm. Um, yeah, I've played some, uh, I think I've played some City Skylines at some point. And oh. I was also, the thing is I'm part also of a Discord of people who um, uh, sort of stream stuff for each other and in particular mm. tend to stream, you know, not the big sort of shooter games and your Overwatches and League of Legends and whatever people stream, but rather more this kind of thing like strategy games, city builders, uh, you know, sort of a little bit more on the indie end of things. And uh, so I also watch a lot of what other people do. I'm actually quite a big stream watcher myself too, hmm. including of course LTS, but also uh, also game streams and things like that. So uh, I have to say for City Skylines, um, that really, uh, for me, it's 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 strayed too far into like, oh, this is actually too difficult to be fun, for me. I like, of course, but I grew up with uh, Sim City. Oh yeah, is, everybody. Sim City. Sim City Four is obviously the best one by general acclaim. I played Sim City on the Super Nintendo. As did I. Yeah, actually. Really? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. So I have a Super Nintendo at home. I have a Nintendo Entertainment System. Oh, that's as nice. far as I know, still works, but I haven't tested in ten years. Or something. Yeah, I actually. I mean, I'm older than I look, so I, mean, I have played. I actually it. have one in the box from uh, from the '80s. I haven't. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Ooh. Yeah, here you want to. Wow. Oh my gosh! Thank There's you loads so of much. Candy. You are too oh, kind. This is, this is Eve from Tiffany Dodge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're yeah, like you apple, have some of and then they're like oh. some sweets and nice. some. I don't eat them like Mars Thank and you stuff. So they know all that. Yeah, I By the way, do you want to do you want to come on in the stream and say hi really quick? Here, so you, hi. You, uh, can, you can actually see yourself there. Yeah, in, in a, a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna have a delay of about forty-five seconds. There we go. Yay! All right, there you go. But yeah, so, uh, we, we told everybody, you know, why we're here. We're here for the Inside Festival. But yeah, if you wanted to show this, give it another this pitch week. for it or say, you know, what you do with it and all that. Well, it's my third year working for Inside Festival, yeah. Inside Science Film Festival. And it's the ninth edition, actually. Mm -hmm. And in this nine years, we've shown like loads of movies and uh, great talks. And we're really happy to have you here. <laughs> and we were so excited. And, uh, it's, uh, we're still going on till Sunday. So everybody's welcome. If you're yeah. nearby to visit, we have a great program this year. <laughs> where you are uh, part of. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You can't actually get to our, our program anymore. Apparently, it's sold out. So Yeah, it's sold out quickly. I just got an email for more people to oh, ask. But wow. it's, it's, that part is sold out. Wow. <laughs> but uh, enjoy the sweets. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much. You. It's even like a new experience to yeah. 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 I will mention something about this because yes. this is also a very Dutch thing. This is uh, what we call um, breakfast cake, if you were to translate Ooh. this literally. E I J. Um, e I J is just the same as I J. It's just a oh, okay. old-fashioned name spelling. You know, really, it's one of those variant it's spellings that people have in uh, in the in, in their last names. Pagenberg is just a name. Well, yeah. I need a taste of that. Yeah, yeah. They what uh, is, make quite a bit of this stuff in Groningen, where I am from. There is one of the biggest factories of this really? kind of stuff. This is something that, as the name suggests, breakfast cake is. Like 
you have for breakfast. A lot of people eat this with butter on it. Mm -hmm. You can also Ooh. get versions where they have, um, what do you call that, candy stuff? Those like sort of uh, crystallized bits of candy that you have on, mm -hmm. you know, the people in Russia having tea and so on. I can't think of the word for this now. Is, oh, I just thought it was thing like that the... was in my drink the other day? Remember the uh, Le Pain Quotidien? You remember? The little crystalline, like, yeah, caramel, yeah. Like things. caramel things. Yeah, basically something like that. Yeah. You can get that on, on them and so on. There's okay. also variations of the raisins and so forth. This is the plain one, I think, which is you know, the least interesting. But this is a very Dutch thing also, in particular, it's a very northern Dutch mm -hmm. thing. So that's very appropriate to have. Yeah, I'm gonna, it's going to make a little bit well, of a mess. But what I'll, are these banana things? So these are like, yeah, sort of vaguely, incredibly synthetically banana flavored sweets. Yes. Okay. They taste like kind of cheap banana caddies. Yeah, okay. by the way, um, oh, this, I, this smells delightful. I, I wanted to mention, in case people don't know this, but um, you know that bananas as we have them now don't taste like original bananas. The only place where you can get original banana flavor is actually sweets like that. That flavor has been preserved since the, the early 20th century. But all the bananas died and out they, from some disease, right? If yes, I right. and so, so that's the only place you can or taste original banana. And yeah, our impression is that it tastes fake. Yeah, but it's really weird. Real, yeah. That apparently is the real Yeah, because there was some kind of banana plague that wiped almost all the bananas out, right? Because they're all clones of each other and so on. I can't wow. remember the exact details. I'm okay. sure Biblaridium can say something more about this, but hmm. uh, I remember this being a thing and uh, uh, this has changed banana culture somewhat. <laughs> what a unique mm. flavor. This would taste lovely, I think, with butter There's and maybe yeah, heat right. it up so a little you, bit. You, you, well, we don't normally heat it, but you, 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 you tend to spread butter on it. At least I certainly, as a kid, used to have this with butter on it. Just, you know, like good spreadable proper butter. It's pretty nice. This and is lovely. Yeah. This is just sort of like, yeah, you can see why we call it breakfast cake. Yeah. It's sort of like cake-ish oh, yeah. kind of substance. It makes me want a, a bit of coffee now. Yeah. Mm. Ontbijtkoek is the good Dutch word for it. Mm. The Pagenberg is one of the main browns. Mm. Nice. Okay, so, um, yeah, Matthijs is a streamer of language, or not language, games, gaming. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't streamed any language stuff, although at some point I, I might, might do that. I don't know, it could be fun to, like, introduce some of my languages and do some stuff with the presenting the grammar and so on. I'm a that. little further with him. It'd be That'd nice be to, really like, show cool. off Easy Kazi or something, which I think is one of my sort of better projects so far. Mm. So you should uh, put together something for Fiat Lingua, too. Yeah, well, I proposed this, right? But then I, I thought that, like, the idea of Fiat Lingua was just, like, to be a repository for, like, putting language stuff on. But there's also, like, an actual queue and there's monthly articles and all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I can write something up about it for sure, yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, I guess, give me some ideas about what uh, what sort of thing we want on there. Ooh, Jake likes Easy Kazi. Yeah, well, that's very sweet of Jake. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, Jake, you know, Jake hates everything. I mean, yeah, it's a, <laughs> oh, bye, a George. serious critic. Just making up, j just making up Jake lore. Okay, and I also did take one of the apple, apple cook. Apple cook. Cook. Apple cook. Apple. Apple cook. Apple cook. 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 Which is an ooh, right? Yeah, it's apple just cook. which accountably we spell with o e. Which it's is the one worst. of the worst aspects of Dutch is that yeah. we spell ooh with o e. That's one of those things that, having learned linguistics and sort of comparative stuff. I have come to realize that this is incredibly stupid. Yeah. This is just not. It, it's, it's, it's the worst one uh, of all of Dutch. Yeah, and it, the Portuguesians got stuck with it. So that's also kind of. Yes, I know. That was the thing. So I read this series of books um, called um, the, it's called the Buru Quartet because it was written Apple in, in, in Buru prison. Um, uh, and uh, the first one is called This Earth of Mankind. Wonderful series of books. But the author is what I thought was pronounced Ananta Pramoedia Tour. Yeah, but it is Pramoedia Tour, yeah. Yeah, Pramoedia Tour. And yeah, I was like, also well known in the Netherlands, yeah. Yeah, and I was like, oh my goodness. And it's like, and it's all because of Dutch orthography. Very simple five valve system. Yeah, yeah, and, and there there is of course a sort of reason for it, which is that we reserve our U, you know, the actual sure. orthographic U for uh, 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 for uh, as in hut, for example. It's the it's I P A Y. No, that's U. Yeah, that's what we use the double U. Oh, yeah, the I, two I U which is for the single U is is uh. Mm -hmm. and so yeah, and then we use two of them for U. There's also a long one. We only have a long one, I think. For the U, as in pure, uh, like pure chocolate, or pure, mm. which is our, 
right? And uh, but the, the the single U, as it were, is just reserved for. Uh. But of course, you know, if you were a conlanger, you would make U a U. Uh, you would make this one with a diacritic, right? That's mm -hmm. essentially what you would do. And yeah. I think that's what we should do. But I remember what we should be asking. Our, right, apple cake Dutch. is great, Patrick. That is actually excellent. This is quite good. Yeah. Um, our Dutch expert here. Mm. So we've been noticing a lot of short phrases, um, or even kind of more clause-like structures, where the verb is final. And it's very interesting, because it's like there was one, um, like the, the newspaper article that was written here. Oh, the, the one in the Gelderlander the, the, about the how we needed title. to build more housing. Or. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, the one that was written about us, ah, the more okay. important one. Oh, the one in the Volkskrant, right. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. But like the title was like, mm our job question mark and then creating a language but like it was yeah, I'm probably gonna say this all wrong in tal bedenken yeah in tal bedenken yeah okay so that is sort of thinking a, up a language a right? language but then creating at the end yes is it typical to see that is it just because there's no subject like what yeah, because the whole thing is is the answer, right? I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's like one thing is the answer to question, what, the sort of implicit right. question, what but is you, your job? But it's the order that we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, no, I get that. So you wouldn't say bedink or bedinken in tal? No, that would be ungrammatical, yeah. Okay. Now, if it I were to... It has to come at the end here. If I were to say, like, I create language, then I would say ik bedinken in, in tal. Yeah. In tal, okay. Okay. But it, so it's just because... So is it the same sort of... Because it's an, it's an infinite construction right so it's like our job a language making right so that's why you have to have it at the end because it's not like a fine a simple finite clause it's so it's in well then let's 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 stretch your your c1 knowledge of German mm -hmm. do you do the same thing like yeah, if, if, you were uh, to say. if you were to think so like um, yeah it was a job also eine Sprache bedenken oder eine Sprache ausarbeiten or something like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. but again, because it's in, in non finite clause, you would put mm -hmm. that at the end. Okay, so now Dutch, though, is it similar to German with its V2 tendencies? Yes. Okay. Yeah. The, there are some differences in that, uh, that, both sort of grammatically and also stylistically. One thing that you find a lot in German, especially written German and even more so in newspaper German, mm -hmm. sort of prestigious German, there is this tendency to want to put all the verbs at the end. Mm -hmm. You remember, right? mm -hmm. all of them have to go at the end and then you get your auxiliaries and your, your matrix verb. And the more you shovel your verbs to the end, the more literary and prestigious mm -hmm. it is to do that. They really like this, so in like proper German papers, you will see this kind of thing a lot. And in Dutch, you don't do that so much. Mm -hmm. And um, also, the order of auxiliary and main verb uh, switches around in certain constructions between Dutch and German. So they are different uh, in, 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 in quite a few uh, kind of clauses. Mm. But the general V2 structure is otherwise very similar. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. That's sort of one of the things that they have in common, right? Is this, mm -hmm. this unique, unique kind of V2 approach. Yeah. Well, that's what, so because earlier David had asked me about that with German, and I was like, I feel like I would put it with like, a language to speak if you were just doing like to speak a language as an infinitive phrase. I was like, I think it would be like eine Sprache sprechen or something. Yeah, like right. That. But then I was like, but I don't know why I think that and I'm not sure I'm right. And so, yeah. Yeah, but was, again, it's this non I think you have to have, they all have to show yeah. up to the end. The V2 is only your standard finite clause, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's why it ends up being like that. Yeah. Well, I, I, I got the impression just looking around seeing Dutch things that there were a lot more verb final structures than I was expecting mm. based on my knowledge of German. But it could have just been, you know, uh, just sample bias, you know. I mean, it's already at this point uh, <coughs> impressive if you see any Dutch around at all, to be honest with you. Every time I go to the Netherlands, there's more English everywhere, which I have some mixed feelings about, I'll be honest. Mm. It's like yeah. more and more stuff, especially in like public signage and you know, like advertising and sort of things that are public facing. I mean, people speak Dutch, of course, but things are public facing are mm -hmm. becoming very, very English oriented now. And uh, this I, you know, this is of course the kind of thing where you become a grumpy old man, you know, yelling at the clouds and so on. I'm definitely entering that kind of stage with regard to <laughs> Dutch where I'm like all the time I see these things in like English, not even always good English, right? Mm -hmm. um, where I think like we have Dutch words for this. We can you or you could come up with something very easily. Like why is this in English? It's, but yeah. And that's actually very something very interesting. It's something that I would love to I would love to be in charge of a documentary of it, just going to different places and just say, why is this English? So for example, like the place that we're 
staying right now, this hotel called Hotel Credible. Um, inside, you know, like the menus, they are in Dutch, and it's like they have like a QR code if you want to translate to English. That's normal. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, that's, that's, that's perfectly sensible, yeah. In all of their decorations, they have these delightful little birds, mm -hmm. just the cutest little birds. And they're, sometimes they're saying things. They are always speaking English, these little birds. And we actually have um, like a phrase inside of our hotel room um, that, again, is also in English. And so it's very clear that this was done as a stylistic choice at some point. And, um, but I, I want to just counter argue mm -hmm. before you go too much further because yeah. the what I noticed for the English sayings and whatnot is mostly in the hotel portion. And I imagine being a university city and next to a film festival, they, they house a lot of foreign visitors. And so the signage and having even decorations in English at the hotel level makes a lot of sense to me because probably not well. Dutch speakers. I mean, but there's no place where the birds are speaking Dutch. Because the hotel is probably meant to house foreign guests. But it's a, it's a restaurant and a bar. The hotel, you don't get the hotel access without a hotel key. I know, I'm talking about outside of it. I didn't see any of it. Oh, sure, absolutely. Like, Everything I saw was at the hotel level. No, like uh, when we were just sitting there eating breakfast, you know, the little bird says, you know, uh, wash your hands, you filthy animal, which is doubly funny because it's referring to a fake movie inside of uh, uh, Home Alone, mm. which itself was trying to parody like a 30s gangster movie, but they needed to control all the dialogue, so they just created a fake gangster movie to put into this movie Home Alone. And one of the famous phrases from that is "keep the change, you filthy animals." That's right, clearly where yeah, it's coming yeah. from. But but yeah, that's in the that's in the restaurant portion. I did not see that. Also, the big map. These are some of our favorite places. You know, for the tourists. Yeah, like but the, the it's map the is bar. for the tourists. It is that the bar. Is also the check-in to the hotel. It's the <laughs> lobby and check-in area of a hotel meant to house foreigners. Yeah, but there are many things like this. I mean, an example, for example, in Utrecht, where my parents live and where I did my undergrad, is we had this campus area outside the city, which is this kind of you know, where a lot of the university buildings are and a lot of the dorms and so on. And this was called the Uithof, which means something like the outer court, right? That's just the sort of historic name of the area where they built this development because it was you know just an empty land, more or less. Mm -hmm. and, um, but in recent years, they have replaced all the si signage, and now it is called Utrecht Science Park. And like, nobody asked for that, right? Sure. There is very much this, Engli this sort of English orientation in Dutch where it's Dutch people who turn things into English with the idea that they are helping or, you know, sort of in some way being nice to international people because mm -hmm. they think that international people want that. But in my experience, they don't because they don't, they aren't surprised that things in the Netherlands are in Dutch, right? No one, <laughs> no one thinks that that's weird or has like an issue with that actually being the case. It's Dutch people who have this yeah. imagination that that is a problem mm -hmm. or that it's like hindering our progress or that it's not cosmopolitan or whatever. And so they sort of on their own account start doing that stuff. Wait, what? Like what on earth? Like I think I can only imagine that Logan uh, w just misspoke or mistyped. Uh, because Logan is saying Home Alone significantly predates Animal House. Not even close. They weren't even in the same decade. Animal House was 80s. Right? Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I, I can't help but believe. <laughs> Why do you even need to check? Like, Home Alone was in the early 90s. Animal House was in the early 80s. <laughs> I actually think, like, in Home Alone is, I think, 90 or 91. Yeah. That, that's Home Alone. And then Animal Houses, I love that you can oh, use my oh phone. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, it's the same phone. Yeah. Sorry. We, okay, so it very, was a mistake. very accidentally, because I got, and it's got a scene on it, but it turns out 90. that the scene is only visible in the very back. And so the sides, I, I thought it would wrap. It oh did my not. God. It was so, yeah. We accidentally got the same case. Oh, it wasn't even the eighties. It was seventy eight. Seventy eight. Yeah, wow. Yeah. I thought it was like eighty or eighty one. Yeah, that's that's what I thought too. But I'm not surprised that it's nineteen seventy eight. Yeah. And then Home Alone is ninety. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, Imagine talking about movies. <laughs> so. There you go. And yeah. Home Alone too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so 
Uh, Mateus, one of the questions up here was uh, something about, you know, if there are any Dutch idioms that we should have in, in English. Not that we need to have them, but are there any Dutch idioms that oh, you, loads. Yeah, no, I use them that you the find delightful that you want to share with us? Yeah, I wasn't asking, does Dutch have idioms? That I just want to take that, make sure no, everyone no, no, knows. No, 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 I know that it does. The question is, are there any that, like, you think might just be delightful to share? The, by the way, really quick, poor guy, he was dead by then. Um, uh, Jim Belushi, mm. who was started in Animal Wiles, he was dead by 98. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah, what Patrick says is actually a very nice thing to point out there, which is there is a famous uh, painting from an early Dutch master, um, which you can see, I think, in the next museum which is actually a uh, portrayal, I think, of a hundred different Dutch expressions and idioms in painted form. Nice. And uh, wow. it's, one of those things, it's one of those things that you go to as a high school kid, you know, they take you there and the challenge is to see how many of these you still know. And about half of them are still current, I would say. Like, Whoa. There are definitely some things there that are very weird and that I you don't know. I mean, of course, specialists have identified all of them. But like a good amount of them are actually identifiable straight up and actually I use like Dutch idioms, it's hard of course when put on the spot to think immediately of examples, but uh, I use actually Dutch idioms which I deliberately literally translate into English all the time. Like I really like saying like, you know, as we say in Dutch, dot dot dot. Oh, did you find it? Is, is, yeah, but I well, want Well, we want to make sure that this is the right one. Is this it? Well, I'm sure it on. is. Oh yeah, yeah, I think that I think it is that. Okay, that so looks correct. Let's give the name and the artist. Well, okay, so the it's uh, Netherlandish proverbs also. Yeah. Um, called Nederland no Nederlandse, maybe spreekwoorden. Ne- yeah, Nederlandse spreekwoorden. Exactly. Nederlandse spreekwoorden. Yeah. And then Peter. Peter Brugge. Brugge. Yeah, Brugel, right? So he made this. And How is this pronounced? B R U E. We say Brugel. Brugel. Yeah, even though the the vowels are reversed, but that's like an okay, a, a so it's like an early so we modern could zoom spelling. In. So. Oh um, my goodness! Oh, like dogs. And uh, no, Patrick, you cannot uh, post URLs. I think only admins can do that in uh, LTS chat. Yeah, if Tethys is is uh, still around, Tethys can do it. Well, also David. Well, never oh, mind. That yeah. takes too much work. Yeah, it'd have to be. But oh my god! Oh, okay, so what's, is this what's needle this in one? a haystack on the roof? What's this? Yeah, so this is like something about throwing pies on the roof. I'm actually not sure what this one is. Um, but that looks like a needle. Yeah, so there's like a needle in a haystack. There's, but there's a lot of like like classic Dutch expressions. Oh, so. wait. No, that's that's not a needle. That's a crossbow bolt. Look. Oh. How interesting. Okay. Okay, so based on this, can you give us yeah, an idiom some, that yeah. is... I'm trying to see if I can... Uh, <laughs> What's this guy? What is he even doing? This is fairly tricky because I need to quickly remember what all of these are. One of them I know is um, that he's doing here is looking for meals in low water, which is a Dutch expression. One that I was recently using, which I really like actually, this is, now I can think of a relevant one that I have, okay. that I have recently mm-hmm. used, which is because uh, my housemates that I live with in Berlin were um, contriving to have some kind of l- big argument about you know stupid shit that people have when they live together. And so I used this Dutch expression, which is that you should not put salt on every slug, which means essentially like, Whoa. you know, you don't make, don't make an issue out of every single little thing. Whoa. Yeah? Wow. And that's, uh, and that's one of those very, very Dutch kind of proverbs that applied here. So, so here's the question, because, you know, I think we need to, we need to do something with this. Do you, are there Patrick, any? Patrick has it, by the way, to shoot a second bolt to find the first. Yeah, oh. that, that, to repeat a foolish action. I don't think that's a current one anyway. It's at least not one that I know. But anyway, sorry, go on. I just wanted to point out that that was one I that can I absolutely do. say Casas Patrick. I can <laughs> and I will. <laughs> Watch me. Oh, thanks, Karis. That's right. Karis is also... Uh, okay. Ah, yeah. Karis can do it also, yes. But... Um, yeah, don't make a matter of a molehill. It's a little bit like that, but it's more specifically about that there are multiple. As it were. You know, a mountain in a molehill implies that you're doing it with one particular thing and like putting salt on every slug. is like there's lots of little things that you shouldn't like make a fuss out of. But what I was going to ask is, there any, are there any uh, idioms that feature uh, dogs, cats, mice, uh, beavers, uh, or opossums or rabbits? Of course, there are loads of loads of these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably not opossums, though. You yeah, not opossums. Have, you don't I don't think those. that that's that's so common. But uh, do you, yeah, actually, what do you in other in other countries? Do you have this expression, plain possum? 
You never heard of it. I don't even know what that means. How do you say that then? It it's it means to like play dead. Yeah. Um, so like if something. If you say it's like um, this, it's oh. similar to stick your head in the sand, where it's like whatever's happening, you're just gonna like play dead, and they'll ignore you and move on to the next. Yeah, thing. you can say yeah. like uh, in Dutch, people, but this, this is less of an expression and more of like still a live metaphor, as it were. It's like playing ostrich. Okay. Which you know also used in a political context, like people are trying to avoid you know confronting yeah, yeah, yeah. something yeah. important or whatever. Something along these lines. I do want to point out, though, that um, the Wikipedia article is really good in that it gives not only the list but it shows you the picture. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so of course they have all being they have all being identified, right? And, and this so. is and this is so like so this is a test that all Dutch students have to pass, otherwise you don't count as Dutch, right? Yeah. I'm so assuming. like when you're 16, you go there, you have to recite them all in front of the class, <laughs> right? And then you can prove that you are in tune with your ancestors. This is the initiation ritual. Yeah. yeah. And it's obviously like, you yeah. you. Yeah. Failed miserably because you so did they, not. They yeah, you out. I, I, you that to, crossbow one for example is no longer uh, no longer relevant. So, <laughs> like I said, about about half of them or so are still current. Sorry, What's he it? who eats fire craps sparks. <laughs> that's that's one of them. You play with fire. Yeah, it's like if you uh, if you burn your ass, you have to sit on the blisters. <laughs> that's a Dutch expression. Also. Really. No. I'm not making that up. Yeah. Wow. Oh my gosh. I I still haven't. It's a little seen bit like it. you know you made your bed and now you lie in it. Something along those lines. Mm. Sure. Oh, and then here to be barely able to reach from one loaf to another, so to have difficulty living that's within a like, budget. And so that was like what no that longer, was. No longer. Relevant. He's trying to reach two different. Can I have, a, have a quick look. There, so I it's not there about his head. It's about his arms. Because there are definitely like things that are still sort of used here but a lot of these are kind of uh, kind of out of date but this for example we still have is to pull to get the longest end it's a little mm -hmm. bit like the, the, the you know the short straw but in reverse it's trying okay. to get to get your advantage to attempt to get the advantage and, and by the way how, get, none of these are in Dutch you have to say them in Dutch so uh, what's that one to pull to get the longest end I got longest end ah, okay that's a thing that you can do and uh, I love though you just nod as you say it like of course like yeah, we should have known that yeah, naturally. What, what is wrong with us? Anyway, I don't want to. I don't want to watch the screen too too long because it's it's amazing. Okay, I'm gonna save that page for myself because yeah, I want to dig through that later because mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. is so fun. I, I can certainly tell you uh, some fun ones. Yeah. Yeah, and now that we know that exists, um, I really wish that like every language had done. Yeah, right. This would. Be, this is such a good yeah. idea, right? Yeah. As yeah. like. Uh, it's actually even for colleagues, I can see it being kind of because that's one of the things that you almost never do, right? Is getting to the stage where you make mm -hmm. proverbs and expressions. So that's really mm -hmm. one of those like last stage kind of things. But it could be fun to develop some of them and also like visualize them in different ways. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, as a way of like, especially if you can draw well and so, then you can really like sort of extend also the visual metaphors that the language is built on. It can actually be quite a nice exercise, I think, in like imagining this sort of way that they look at the world and the kind of things they interact with. Yeah. Well, say I just created an idiom. Ooh. Remember I told you yes, in, yes. in Jwadi, um, I created an idiom. And a little, I guess it could almost be like a little proverb, like one of these. Mm. Um, but the way that you say someone is lucky um, is you say that the smoke rises for them. Oh, that's right. Because like if you're sitting around a campfire, every, you know, it's, the wind changes and you get smoke in your face. Uh -huh. And it's awful. Um, and so if you, you say someone's lucky if the smoke rises for them. And so, um, zosh, zosh leza zine would be the smoke rises for him. He is very lucky. Yeah, yeah. We we have a we have a much more Dutch version, I think, relating to something similar, which is, uh, the sun rises for nothing. Ah. Oh. Which is a Dutch expression, sort of meaning something like it's actually people give it different interpretations, but it, I think originally it means something like there's no such thing as a free lunch or like oh, you'll, yeah, you'll never yeah, get things yeah. for free. And, but it's this kind of sarcastic thing, like ah, oh, you got all the sunrise yeah. for nothing. Yeah, but I'm not gonna do it. Which I think is a good expression of the Dutch oh. mentality in, uh, in general. So also, though, I will say mm -hmm. I said the wrong pronoun. Sorry, Aza would be for him. There you go. I said for you is Leza. Yeah. Mm, how so embarrassing. Uh, so Logan, by the way, I it's 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 always embarrassing to mix up something, but just to to try to help out, I'll I'll share something uh, embarrassing about me that relates to the Netherlands. So the first time I was here, 
Um, I uh, came into and out of Schiphol, the the airport here in Amsterdam. This time we're flying in and out of uh, Paris because we're also going to France after this. But um, anyway, uh, on the way back at Schiphol, there you have, uh, it was right before the gate, it was essentially like a, a Dutch customs agent who was mm -hmm. like, you know, asking like, you know, what purchases I had made and so on. And, and so, like, it was basically finding we were trying to bring in any contraband. But I said, oh, I, I, just, got some, uh, I just got some souvenirs. Uh, and so he, he looks at me, he's like, he's like, oh, hopefully not those, uh, you know, the clogs or windmills. Mm -hmm. Horrible yeah. little Delft blue nonsense and, and, and like terrible little tacky clogs. And and yeah, yeah. He's saying this as he's opening up my bags, which and is sees, of course, and that I that he pulls out a pair of fluffy pink clogs, which I had gotten for my little sister, and then some salt and pepper shakers that were cows and windmills that I had gotten for my parents. And so he just pulls them out right after saying this, looks at me, just goes. <laughs> nope. We have to be dismissed as a cringe American. Uh, I, I was done. To leave. I was done. I was just close to my bag. He's like, get out of my country. I will say, <laughs> I have actually worn clogs legitimately in my life. Wooden ones? Yeah, yeah, as in le legitimate, proper wooden clogs. Uh, they are actually quite handy. The, the, the point with the clog is they're made in such a way that your uh, shoes don't stick in the mud. Mm -hmm. So when you have a really muddy field, it's mm -hmm. somehow something about, you know, I don't know crap about it, but something about the way that they are designed is such that you don't sort of sink and then get stuck. So it's actually mm -hmm. quite handy if you are in muddy sort of agricultural it's, land um, that it works that way. Similar. It's essentially the same kind of science, but different shape as um, snowshoes. Yeah, I guess so. Because it's, it's like, it's like, like it keeps polished. you on top of a Exactly. It's a just kind of polished wood thing, and yeah. then it's sort of like something about the way that it's made. Like, yeah, exactly. And I think it's also the, like, it because it is wider on bottom, and it's yeah. something about the dispersal of weight uh, in Exactly. Such like, there's a way obviously something it, like yeah. this going on, but that would require knowing anything about natural mm -hmm. sciences whatsoever, right. so that's out of the question. But. Um, and is this, I, I guess this must have been a misunderstanding. Is this something that you wear over your normal shoe? No, uh, or at least when I did it, I wore them just, you know, socks and clogs. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not that common these days. I mean, people also just like wear wellies and things like this, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's sort of a little, little old fashioned in certain, in certain regards. You do have like what people would also in the past when people really wore them all the time, what they would have is these kind of, you know, in, indoor shoes and you can fit yeah, those yeah, in, yeah. you can fit those into the clog and yeah. then you can do it that way. But I just wore them as such. I think it is also possible to get like larger sizes that you can fit like your regular shoes into, but mm. it's not sort of necessary to do that. But I definitely wore them up north sometimes. Like uh, we had this little family house thing in Drenthe and there were a lot of like sort of muddy fields around there and I wore worn clogs as a kid. So it's a is a real thing in that way, and we do have a lot of windmills. And that is also actually true. That's because you're harnessing the the power of the wind. I this mean, makes that's sense. just brilliant. Yeah. Nice. What are things the Americans think are normal but are weird to the Dutch? I mean, that's a long list. How, how, <laughs> how much time do you have? It's like pretty much everything about America. Of course, the biggest thing is talking to strangers. Is, would be one of the, the main things, right? It's like, if you really want to, but that's not just a Dutch thing, but if you really want to like, what's the sort of most obvious cultural contrast between Northern Europe and America going there? And I've been, of course, to both a lot. So I know it quite well. Is uh, you know just a level of extroversion that is both expected and accepted in well in culture. I mean, you say that, but I mean, I I feel like if a Dutch person goes to Finland, they'll look at you and say, "Who is this extrovert?" Oh no, for sure. I mean, the Finns <laughs> are like a, a whole extra level, right? But it's Damn. sort of like a spectrum of, of that. It's like the Dutch are sort of more on the gregarious end of Northern Let's Europe, right? Let's just say I think I belong in Finland. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's true. But I mean, even we and even people from like Sweden and Germany make fun of the Finns for being so like stodgy and taciturn and like you know and like non-communicative, right? So so it's it is a spectrum there. But then the Americans are very much on the other end, where it's like people just go up to you and tell you their life story and things like this. Mm -hmm. No one would ever do that here. But it goes to be really nice. I mean, last time I was in D.C., I got like lots of positive attention for how I look and my, my outfits and stuff like this. And people come up to me and say, like, hey, that's so cool and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Would never happen in Germany. Never. Mm -hmm. No one would ever do that. Even if they thought it, they wouldn't say. Yeah. And, you know, that, that can be fun as well. So I actually quite like that about America. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's up? 
What are you laughing I, at? I'm just looking at what's going on here, and that's just... <laughs> The, it, it, it's too it's it's too much on the pun spectrum for her to even be punny. And is, <laughs> is the other plans. <laughs> oh my god, that's awesome. I feel like Patrick has to judge this. He's yeah, the, uh, he's the professional. Come in and judge. judge. Come in and judge. Call and see if this is acceptable. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Next time you're at DC, we'll make you feel at home. I will not say a single thing. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, so we're we're getting close to the end here. Yes. So uh, we should probably start uh, working on some con lighting. Yeah, right. I think. I <laughs> no, think, it wasn't a work stream, so there's no work. Know, it's know, it's what Mateus wants to say about con linging and language. Yeah. This is. This is Matesa's show, and you yeah, now have is, three minutes yeah, to make it your, your chance. show. This is your chance. This, this is your my, platform. So I guess I'll just undress now, right? There we go. <laughs> so oh, I was uh, going to say you're, what you, you, you were going to go on your 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 screed against uh, you know against uh, uh, let's have a booba, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. My eternal rivalry with yes. let's have a booba. Yeah, that that's we right. that that you know it's like Oceania. We've always been at war with let's have a booba. <laughs> yeah. That's, I that's like what the, like booba. That's what the NL stands for. It's no, let's have a booba. No, let's have a booba. That's yeah, right. Yeah. But that's just because, you know, I wasn't allowed to make inappropriate comments. Let's have a booba anymore. So it's like, <laughs> well, I don't know what, to, what else to do. That's all I've got. You know, that's, that's my only line. <laughs> uh, yeah. Exactly. Episode two flashbacks. Like, oh, yes, that's, that's exactly it. And ever since, I have not been invited back. So what can Ooh. I say? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, Jake getting skewered here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, otherwise, yeah. What, what's what's to say? I mean, a cool thing that we're all doing, I guess, in the community is the calling year, right? Which we're working on, and uh, I'm also trying to or going to try. And, uh, I have a holiday next week. I'll be in Greece. Like, I might have the opportunity to start catching up a little bit with my own calling work nice. on that. Since you know, I was otherwise occupied for a little while, and uh, yeah. now I'm gonna try and uh, mm -hmm. focus again a little bit on calling, and so that should be nice. And uh, work on especially the latest of my eight languages or something Woo! at this point. And I still want to like make more of a point of uh, publishing the grammars and sort of developing, presenting them a little better of the ones mm -hmm. that I have done. Not that I necessarily consider them finished. I will still be working on them, but sort of putting out some of these stuff. I think I've posted them on certain occasions in the Discord now, but a little bit ad hoc. It would be nice to have like put them on a website or something. Mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah. Do something with that that I think would be cool. Yeah, I can't believe Patrick missed that. I thought Patrick was here early on. Did you just step out? Oh, it was because of all of the. All the maintenance that we ordered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's because you know we the, the drillers came in, the hammerers came in, the beavers came in, the possums right, came in. Right, right. Like yeah, yeah. yeah. You know that's. Uh, they were actually um, they were going into all of Patrick's pipes and just drilling into them to see if they could be drilled into, and then if they could, they of course need to be replaced. Yeah, of course, because yeah, right. That's, uh, <laughs> Matthias Time Studio. See, that's that was my original suggestion for for the name of this show. I don't know why they didn't go with it, but it's a, right. it was a, it was a oh, tough choice. Oh, now I see what we should have called this episode. Hold on. There we go. Oh yeah. yes. <laughs> time is also what we call uh, time. The uh, uh, herb. Oh, the yeah, 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 yeah. The, Oh, you called it the LTS relay. I love it, Jake. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Bye, Logan. See you, Logan. Oh, yeah, well, it's gosh. actually, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's 4 p.m. on the dot. Yeah, um, and then. Or as we, as we generally call it, Logan meeting time. Um, yes, exactly. Logan's That's right. meeting time. That's what 4 yeah. p.m. Well, it's as we know, it's half, half three, right? That's <laughs> what it is. It is half. Oh, half, half. Oh, I I, mm, I, I, I start I, I uh, as I was listening to that I, my brain was trying to do the math of it and I was just done done absolutely mm -hmm. done all right well anyway thank you all for being here at this irregular time um, with our irregular guest hopefully regular guest with no, this I have certain stream. expectations now okay right 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 right, right. of course um, honestly you can any any time you show up to the stream you can be on the show okay that's okay. that's well, uh, uh, that is an invitation. 
Uh, and so, yeah, uh, Let's Have a Booba is uh, it's a, a very fine show. It's no McCain and L, but it's something. It's up there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Anyway, so uh, thanks for joining us. And yeah, we will see you next next week at the usual time. Yes. For our usual stream, though, a reminder that the United States has moved its clocks its clocks forward ahead of the rest of Europe, so it might not be the regular time for you. But we'll get all things sorted by April. Yeah, it's. I think um, Europe doesn't move ahead until the end of March, and so for the next yeah. like two weeks or so, maybe even three weeks, um, be aware of that. All of our European friends. Yeah. Um, yeah, between me times. because I did miss it last year, if I remember. Yeah, right. yeah, I yeah. missed half an episode yeah. because of that, so it's yeah. useful to know. I don't know. It's the the undifferentiated Europe. I don't know, Jake, Europe, honestly. Exactly. I, I assume, actually, uh, in Britain, for some reason, they, uh, I don't know, they move, like, ahead uh, one minute a day for 30 days, and they call it half daylight savings time for some reason. Anyway. Well, they're on the king's time now, right? They were on the queen's time, and now they have switched to the king's time, My so it's goodness. a different system now that they use. It. Wow, so they don't have, the clocks actually stay still until the king happens to check his watch, and then they update yeah, it to they, whatever they he just saw. Whatever his time is, that is the actual time. Well, uh, Ragdoll, I'm not sure, just... Double check the conversion, like Google it. Um, yeah, you know, because like the day before or something. Because yeah, we uh, we have moved ahead an hour from yes. where we had been. You know, the last time we streamed on a Thursday. Yeah. So anyway, it all will right. Say, it will say on the yes. schedule for the LTS uh, uh, pre whatever on YouTube, right? It usually says in your local time. It like usually this, yes. this will start yeah. at whatever time. So I think you can do it that way. Yep. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, stay grammar, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. <sighs> Thank God.